Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. This is our first ever Zoom only uh, event at the Petrie Film Center. We're extremely excited for it. You know, we wish the circumstances were different and we could welcome you all at Harvard, but we are really thrilled by the panel we have today, the set of panels we have. Uh, the event, of course, is on artificial intelligence and disability slash dependency, equity, access, and interdependence. It's sponsored by the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School, the Harvard Law School Project on Disability, the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University, the Reagan Strife Institute, and the Present Center at Stanford University School of Medicine, with additional support by the Oswald D.N. Kahneman Fund at Harvard University. As I and many other people are struggling with technology today, uh, imagine how much of a challenge the future may bring to people, especially those who struggle with disability or dependency in the use of artificial intelligence in their daily lives as to how it will affect their health care, their mobility, their access to the rest of the world. And that is uh, the main topic for today's event. Extremely excited by the people we have here. In a moment, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Michael Stein, who will be the first moderator. But before I do a couple more mentions, Normally at this point, I would point you where the bathrooms are. Hopefully you know where the bathrooms are <laughs> in your home or office. But I did want to mention that unfortunately, because this is our maiden voyage with the Zoom event, we are not going to do audience Q&A. Instead though, we want to enable people to continue the conversation via Twitter. And we have a hashtag. It is hashtag AI and disability with the words and spelled out. So AI, A-N-D, disability. And we're extremely excited for this event. But beyond this event, our next online only event will be Friday, an event on medical debt. And if you enjoy this, we hope you will come back for that as well as tell your friends. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Michael Stein, who will lead us through the first part of our event. Michael, I'm handing it off to you. Thank you ever so much, Glenn, and thank you everyone for joining us today. It's a new adventure for all of us and we're very excited. And I have to say what a wonderful, wonderful pleasure to work with all our colleagues. Um, as Glenn noted, uh, AI, artificial intelligence is something that is on in the reality for people with disabilities and dependencies. We use smartphones and other devices to enable ourselves, but at the same time, there are also many concerns about what AI will do or what it can do uh, as far as use or misuse of large data, decision-making, and so on. And so we have a wonderful panel. Their biographies are uh, set out in more detail on the Petri Flom website. I will introduce them because they'll have 15 minutes each, and I know you'd rather hear them than hear me. Um, and then if we have a few minutes left over, I'll throw a question or two to the panelists, and then we'll shift over to our next panel. We'll begin with Dr. Noel Campbell um, from the Reagan Strife Institute, and we'll move then to Jennifer Hawkins, who teaches both in the Department of Philosophy and who teaches bioethics at Duke Medical School. And then we'll end up with Betsy Bowman, the CEO of Benetech. So we're going to be moving from narrow perspective to medium perspective to even broader perspective. Noel, why don't you start us off? Wonderful, thank you, Michael. Uh, and hello from Indianapolis. I wanna first appreciate the invitation uh, from the organizers of this meeting um, and, the, and the opportunity to join, a, again, a great panel. Uh, so my work has been focused on uh, the recognition and prevention of uh, adverse cognitive effects. Let me step back a little bit more and, and let you know that by training, I'm a pharmacist and, and spend most of my time in clinical research, focusing on the population of older adults um, with cognitive impairment or at risk of cognitive impairment. And that can include dementia or deliriums. And so in this work, I'm particularly interested in the recognition and prevention of adverse effects from medications. Uh, therefore, much of this work is nested in, in the population with a disability defined as those, as I mentioned, with or at risk of cognitive impairment or dementia. So my contribution to this forum would be to highlight first what's a well-recognized challenge of developing AI tools for populations with disability. In particular, I'll focus on cognitively impaired older adults. 
It, so it's long been described that only about 40% of older adults with dementia are identified in electronic medical record databases. And these databases predominantly represent those used in electronic medical record systems of various types, EPICS, Cerner's, and even some of the VA systems. Um, this recognition is primarily defined as the presence of a diagnosis code indicating some form of cognitive impairment or dementia. So because this knowledge and, and tools built using AI methodologies rely on these databases as training sets for, machine, for things like machine learning, the applicability of these results to the population with cognitive impairment isn't well known. Uh, so until this rate of recognition improves, this represents a key area in which the bias from the data sources may perpetuate or even be enhanced um, in the findings or the tools created using AI methodologies. So the challenge for those uh, working in the field of AI development, from my perspective, is to be aware of the lack of the completeness of key identifiers in large data sets that prevent the application of knowledge or tools beyond the populations in which the results are derived. If I say it differently, the knowledge generated from a particular data set really applies to those within just that data set, but may not apply to subgroups of that data set that may not be identifiable. So I'll give a quick example. Uh, so if we suppose that AI, AI methodologies are used to identify patterns of hospitalization among older adults living in the community, these patterns can include such key variables that are often easily recognizable in, in EMR data sets, uh, such as the presence of heart failure or kidney disease. However, among the group or the population with dementia, uh, other factors have been proven to be influential for hospitalization rates. These can particularly include the stress of the caregiver. However, the, the variable of the stress of the caregiver is not, is not available in the large majority of electronic medical record databases. So therefore, it wouldn't turn up as a key variable um, in a predictive model of identifying hospitalization rates in this population with disability. So as such, the results of an AI-generated tool may not have an impact on populations with, with a particular disability such as cognitive impairment. And in fact, it may cause unintended harms or waste valuable resources by pursuing uh, the findings of, of the finding of such an analysis. So to address this, a suggestion would be uh, for the application of AI tools in populations with disabilities to emphasize an augmented approach to the development of knowledge or tools rather than purely using artificial intelligence alone. Um, and the augmentation could be used, could be performed by incorporating human intelligence to include those with knowledge in populations with disability or to ask important questions about the application or usability of tools created from uh, traditional AI methods. So I'll next comment on uh, briefly on our work related to AI uh, as, we've, as we've conducted this, particularly in the use of clinical decision support methods uh, as an opportunity to re reduce potential adverse clinical outcomes from high risk behaviors. And in my particular interest, it's the use of uh, these tools to uh, prevent high risk or high risk behaviors, which we define as uh, Use of, use of and prescribing of high-risk medications in older adults. So approximately 14 years ago, and I'm gonna click over to some slides here uh, and share my screen, because I know I wasn't invited to the panel uh, for my looks. So screen share has stopped unexpectedly. I'll try once more. And if that doesn't work, then that's okay. Okay, it looks like we're successful here um, by my screen. So let me get first started with, um, uh, with uh, the first example of how we've used AI methodologies to support clinical decision, decision making uh, with a study about 14 years ago uh, that we conducted in a hospitalized older adults. Uh, and we employed a fairly primitive method of clinical decision support directed purely at physicians in the hospital setting in hopes of uh, reducing prescriptions or, or orders for medications with, with high risk. So you can see this, we called this study the ECHAM study. 
And the goal was to improve the care of hospitalized older adults with acute or chronic cognitive impairment. The justification for the, for the studies is shown here. And you can see the model, uh, somewhat of the logic model that we were using at the time that recognizes the risk of medications contributing to uh, adverse clinical outcomes in the hospital settings. And those could include delirium, those could include other things like use of restraints or, or delayed uh, or prolonged hospitalization. So we employed a, a fairly primitive reminder system for our physicians when they were alerting or when they were trying to prescribe certain medications that we define as high risk. And in this case, we're calling anticholinergic. So you can see abbreviated on this screen um, with ACH. So we, we set out to test the impact of this purely computerized decision support system that identified patients uh, who, fit the, who fit the risk criteria that we were looking for. And it was delivered just to physicians prescribing a certain type of high risk, prescribing a certain type of high risk medications to vulnerable older adults. So the next, in this next slide, we can see a brief description of the population that we studied. These were uh, predominantly female, uh, and they were predominantly African American through our partner health system of Eskenazi Health. And on the right side, you can see, again, this was done, as I mentioned, 14 years ago, using one of the first electronic medical record systems developed by the Regents Reef Institute. And you can see a, a snapshot of what the screen alert looked like. And it was a message to the provider warning them of the presence of cognitive impairment and the risks of what they were trying to order. In this case, it was a Foley catheter. Uh, we also employed the majority of the interventions here were medication related. So we designed this uh, clinical decision support system uh, to target these medications. But what was interesting is that we found that although logic served that we should, uh, we should have a significant impact on the prescription of these medicines, we tried to evaluate this in a few different variables that we could construct. But we didn't really see a significant, a, a large reduction in the number of uh, prescriptions that were reduced for these high-risk medications. Overall, the use of high-risk medication was, was fairly low and that only about one quarter of the population hospitalized received one of these prescriptions. But the introduction of the clinical decision support system didn't have a significant reduction in their overall exposure over the course of the, of the hospitalization. So we learned from providers from that um, after seeing these failed results that we asked providers, why, why don't you think that this worked? And the, the main message that providers gave us was that you know, these alerts that pop up in the electronic medical record system, we're used to them and we don't think that they're personalized. So what we'd like for you to do is to give us, is to use an augmented approach uh, to this clinical decision support systems. Uh, give us a human and follow up where we don't follow these recommendations. Give us a human, give us a pharmacist to bug us and tell us that, hey, you should be doing something different. So in our next iteration, we tried this. We did this in what was called the, PA, the PMD, or the Pharmacologic Management of Delirium Study. Again, using the same uh, insult and vulnerability model for high-risk older adults, this time focusing on those in the ICU who actually had a diagnosis of delirium, which is not uncommon in the, in the ICUs, and approximately 50% or even higher in some populations experience delirium in the ICU. And we've recognized a few risk factors. So in our, in our second iteration of our decision support methods, we actually used a combination of both computerized only, focused at the physician level, as well as a human. Now the human and computerized focused on the anticholinergic medications, the human only on the benzodiazepines. Now this third arm of the haloperidol is more of a treatment approach or a treatment approach we were testing for the time. We're not gonna focus on that because it wasn't delivered through uh, artificial intelligence, but only through human. And so interestingly, our combination of augmented plus artificial intelligence in this decision support model wasn't significantly influential in reducing exposure to high-risk medications. So you can see here, we show these by the p-values, but in a post-randomization phase here of the population enrolled, we weren't able to reduce the exposure to these high-risk medications in this population through the combined and and the artificial and augmented intelligence methods here. But however, you can see a, a trend toward a reduction in the exposure towards benzodiazepines, which is only delivered through the augmented or human-based delivery of, of decision support. 
And so we asked again, why did this happen? And we began to define the uh, use of medications or risk of medication use, of high-risk medication use, um, as behaviors. So it could be they could be defined as um, behaviors based on pres physician prescribing practices, but also on patient medication use. And we also were learning from a, a collaborative group up in Canada at the time who taught us that you know, more patient-focused approaches and direct-to-consumer approaches were had been successful in motivating users of high-risk medications to reduce or stop these medicines. So we began to we began to package both automated and augmented artificial intelligence through clinical decision support with behavioral economic principles in priming people and, and turning attention towards users of these uh, users or, or different sources or expanding our um, scope of interventions that we could employ um, that, that made an impact of more behavioral economic principles. And so we began to set, set out to widen our scope of interventions as well as intervention targets to experiment with different methods. So right now we're using these interventions, uh, as you can see on this slide, uh, we've developed, developed some uh, patient directed or consumer focused apps that will improve awareness of some key decision factors for making some of these decisions. We've told stories through environmental cues and telling stories of like-minded people who are facing similar um, decisions. We're also, we're at the same time, we're not um, completely straying away from physician-focused interventions, but really packaging them together uh, and also making and also making uh, making it easier by setting defaults for making changes that we think are uh, safer uh, safer forms of uh, the use of AI technologies. So we're we're packaging these in we're packaging these together and also studying them separately by focusing on patients and physicians. So we've got a couple of trials that are ongoing, and I just want to highlight those uh, very briefly as I kind of wind down my comments here for this panel. We're experimenting with we're experimenting with um, interventions that are targeting patients, just patient, patients in one study, patients and physicians in another, and in the third study uh, that really uses more of a human-based care coordinator model uh, that is supporting both patients and physicians to reduce the use of high-risk medications. So we won't know the results of these studies for some time. Uh, given that one study is in the analysis phase while the other two are in uh, the second year of a five-year experiment. Uh, but we will learn from these studies how to support high-risk behaviors with varying degrees of uh, automated and augmented intelligence and whether patient or consumer targeted interventions fare better uh, than physician targeted interventions when focusing on high-risk medication prescribing. So I'll close here and briefly summarize my talking points. And that's first that the development of uh, of artificial intelligence should really consider gaps in training sets used to uh, develop the knowledge uh, and tools and recognize where populations with disability are poorly recognized or underrepresented in these databases. Second, the, uh, the tools developed through AI methods should consider the role of augmented approaches, both in the development and implementation phases to address potential gaps in population-specific knowledge. And then thirdly, it's particularly important to, uh, to after the development of these uh, artificial intelligence tools, uh, to really test them through rigorous clinical trials, testing the efficacy and potentially the unintended consequences or potential side effects of AI tools. Um, and that these steps are particularly necessary uh, before widespread adoption into the clinical environment should take, should take place. With that, with that, I'll close and offer the floor back to Mr. Stein for further discussion. That's wonderful, Noel. Thank you very much. And actually, we're going to move on to Jennifer, and then we'll circle back and do some Q&A if we have time. Jennifer? Hello. Let's see. Am I visible? No. You're very... my... hmm. I unmuted, but I don't see. I see and hear you, Jennifer. You oh, see... you do? 
Okay, well, then that's fine. <laughs> I can't see myself, but that's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, as you'll see, my comments are a bit broad after a very specific and uh, lovely presentation we just heard. Um, so let me start this way. The topic, of course, for this conference is huge. In recent years, as we know, the world of AI has exploded. And though it's not quite caught up, the literature on the ethics of AI is also exploding. Yet so far, much of this ethics literature doesn't touch very much on disability or persons with disabilities. Now, AI, as we can see, has the potential to improve the lives of persons with disabilities in many ways. And I think that's going to be one of the things we see in a number of the talks today. And I wouldn't argue with that. That's, that's great. You know, there are amazing possibilities that are opening up that we should definitely embrace. However, I'm going to take a step back and say a little bit more on the cautionary side about some of the dangers that AI might they might pose for persons with disabilities. Persons with disabilities are already marginalized in our society. We live in a high-paced uh, society that places a high value on youth, health, ability, achievement, where achievement is rather narrowly understood. Moreover, it's worth emphasizing here that disability is a huge umbrella term, right? It captures all sorts of conditions and impairments. So I think it's important to distinguish between physical and or mobility impairments, sensory impairments like blindness or deafness, cognitive impairments, and psychological impairments or mental illness. And this is not exhaustive by any means. And cutting across all of those distinctions is a further important one between long-term disability and acquired disability. And that distinction matters, I think, because the perspectives of those who have acquired disability late in life is often quite different from the perspectives of those who've always been disabled or who have been disabled for most of their lives. So I want to focus first on persons with disabilities and the healthcare system. But even before that, I think it's important to review some of the ways that ordinary non-disabled people often misinterpret persons with disabilities. It's well documented that people without disabilities tend to view disability through a very negative lens. They report a strong preference for never experiencing disability themselves, if at all possible, and they make strongly negative assumptions about what it is like to live with various disabilities. It's also well documented that those assumptions don't line up with what we know about the lives of many persons with disabilities. Most people with disabilities report high quality of life. Indeed, in most cases, they report a level of subjective satisfaction with their life that's comparable to the subjective satisfaction reported by people without disabilities. This initial failure to appreciate what it's like to live with disability leads to many other false assumptions on the part of those who are not disabled. For example, many doctors, at least those who do not regularly work uh, with patients with disabilities, tend to assume that patients who come to them who have disabilities must be coming for some health-related concern connected to the disability. Many of them also assume that patients would like a fix for the disability. And they fail to grasp that many persons, not all, but many, are merely seeking ways to live healthy lives with the disability they have. And indeed, for some people with disabilities, their disability forms a core part of their identity, something they would not necessarily want to lose, or at least they would be deeply ambivalent about losing. Because persons without disability view it so negatively, they often fail to appreciate the kinds of medical care that persons with disabilities want and need. And you can glean examples of this from looking at the kinds of materials that have been developed in recent years, aiming to better educate clinicians and medical students, and thereby hoping to improve the care of persons with disabilities. So, for example, a clinician who unreflectively assumes that the lives of disabled people are incredibly restricted may also assume wrongly that a particular patient with disability is not sexually active and so might not advise the patient in important matters of sexual health in the same way that she would her other patients. 
or if a clinician assumes that life with certain types of disability is of very low quality, she may not approach the treatment of persons with those particular disabilities who are aging in the same way that she would approach other patients of hers who are aging. And those are just a few examples. Okay, now I want to consider how the widespread adoption of AI technologies in healthcare might exacerbate certain problems that already exist. One conflict that gets mentioned frequently in the literature on ethics and AI is the potential conflict between accuracy and fair treatment. And the basic idea is pretty familiar to most people by now, right? Uh, some applications of AI, in particular uh, algorithms that are used for decision making, can be much more accurate than human judgment in some domains. So reliance on these algorithms can greatly improve decision making and improve lives. But sometimes the very same tool that represents an overall improvement in decision making may be poor at making decisions for a particular subgroup of people. And problems like this have been described in many contexts, particularly in relation to race, where the problem is typically about the, the flawed data sets that are used as the starting point. But today, I want to focus on a slightly different issue that could arise, um, because the algorithms that many people envision for the future of healthcare sometimes incorporate treatment recommendations. Though we're not yet there, many people believe or hope that in the near future, many clinical decisions will be made by algorithms. The hope in this case is for improved diagnosis, as well as improved ability to identify the very specific stage of a disease or the precise degree of injury, and then the ability to map this more precise illness information or disease information to um, specific treatment options. So an example might help here, right? Consider, for example, that the amount of information we have about the treatment for some illnesses is quite staggering. Uh, it's changing all the time as well. A doctor would therefore have a hard time keeping track of all of the best practices. But even that's not all. For AI, if it were fed rich enough data sets about treatment outcomes over time for large populations, it might be able to detect patterns we would miss. It might re recognize, for example, that certain kinds of treatment or certain regimens, combinations of treatment are more appropriate at one stage of illness, less appropriate at another. So algorithms could help us tailor treatment to particular patients and thereby improve health outcomes. Now, the problem, as I see it, is just that the algorithm in these cases isn't offering a diagnosis, it's making a treatment recommendation. And recommendations are value judgments. You can't make a treatment recommendation without first identifying some goal, maybe the goal is implicit, but some goal for treatment. A recommendation is just simply telling you the best way to reach your goal. But the goals of medicine are plural and they're invariably value-laden. To see this, suppose you wanna know which treatment for pancreatic cancer at a certain stage is optimal. Well, first you have to answer optimal in what sense? Perhaps, all you want to know is which treatment will maximize longevity, but longevity itself is a value that not everyone values equally. Indeed, most people can think of at least some cases where they wouldn't want longer life if, for example, longer life could only come with untreatable chronic pain, for example. Of course, in reality, I imagine that you know, any health goals uh, used in algorithms will be much more complex They'll probably be designed to take into account a number of health-related values, and they'll presumably assign them different weights relative to one another. But my basic point remains the same, namely that however, whatever values you put in, or however you relate, how many of them, how you weight them against one another, you're still making a value judgment. The weighting of health values, I imagine, will probably be based on large sets of data about the preferences of the majority of patients with a certain illness or certain you know, situation. And since people with disabilities often have preferences that differ and sometimes quite dramatically from those of the majority of patients, this means that those algorithms wouldn't necessarily give recommendations that truly serve the interests of that population. For example, it's highly likely that 
such algorithms would reflect the fact that the majority of the population strongly prefers to avoid certain forms of disability, but those who have lived happily for a long time without being able to function in particular ways that are prized by the majority may have a very different way of prioritizing health values. Individuals, of course, could always challenge a recommendation that was made for them, right? They could require their physicians to discuss with them in more depth, to consider other options that might better serve them. But I think there remains a worry, even so. Namely, there's a background worry that increased reliance on mechanized decision-making may, at least if we're not careful, lead to a certain kind of complacency about the outputs of algorithms among clinicians and perhaps also among patients. And if that were the case, then you would have many more cases where some patients don't receive the care they really should, um, or they must come prepared to aggressively defend their different needs and different perspectives. All right, I want now to briefly mention one other but very different kind of worry that could arise in connection with AI and disability. I began with the tension between the value of increased accuracy and precision on the one hand and the fair treatment of individuals on the other. And now I want to consider a potential tension that could arise at a societal level between the benefits of much greater personalized knowledge on the one hand and social solidarity on the other. And here's what I mean. In a 2019 report for the Nuffield Foundation on the ethics of AI, the authors speculated that increasing ability to identify who is vulnerable to what and to what degree, abilities that may well come with certain applications of AI, could serve to undermine or weaken collective commitment to helping all members of society. As they put it, quote, these ideals, the ideals of solidarity, invite us to think of ourselves as citizens and not just individual consumers, and they encourage us to provide for each other in the face of unexpected blows of fate that are beyond individual control. Now you might wonder, well, why would AI lead to a decline in solidarity? The authors offer one purely hypothetical example, but it's intended to help readers better envision the general set of worries in this area. So they say, suppose that, quote, a company markets a new personalized insurance scheme using an algorithm trained on rich data sets that can differentiate between people in ways that are so fine-grained as to forecast effectively their future medical and other care needs. The company is thus able to offer fully individualized treatment better suited to personal needs and preferences. The success of this scheme, however, leads to the weakening of publicly funded services because advantaged individuals see no reason to support those with greater needs. Now, this case is hypothetical, but I think it speaks directly to issues of disability. For many forms of acquired disability come as a part of illness or as part of aging. And right now, we cannot usually predict who will develop what forms of acquired disability or when. And because this is true of all of us, we're more likely to see ourselves as, people like to say, all in the same boat. But if we could easily and accurately predict who will develop dementia and exactly when, or who later in life will likely need to be in a wheelchair with various other related supports, then we really would be able to distinguish to a large extent those who will eventually be disabled and those who won't. And we might even be able to distinguish between those who will be disabled in more or less expensive ways. However, I suspect, or at least my worry, I should say, goes a bit further. For I suspect that some of our general commitment to persons with disabilities, and I'm now talking about all disabilities, all impairments, including people uh, who have had impairments from birth, that our commitment to such people stems from the sense that we are all in this together, that any of us might, and most of us will, experience disability at some time. So I worry that the development of powerful predictive tools would not only undermine commitment to those particular individuals recognized as likely to develop disabilities at a certain time, 
but might also weaken the general commitment to the rest of the disabled community. I don't claim, of course, to know that this would occur. And I'm not claiming that it's a kind of rational progression. If the basis for the old solidarity was the thought that anyone could experience disability, then in some sense, the basis for solidarity would never go away. The likelihood of experiencing disability may in the future dwindle for certain people, but it will never be zero. Some forms of acquired disability will always remain beyond our ability to predict, and some forms of congenital disability will no doubt always be with us. But it nonetheless seems plausible that an increasing sense among individuals in a society that they have control over more and more aspects of their lives, aspects that used to be beyond control, that this will increase the overall sense that their problems are not my problems, and thereby weaken the sense Jennifer, that, all forms of the community, up, no, that we owe each other the basic forms of aid that enable a decent life. And erosion of that sense, if it occurs, and to the degree it occurs, will affect many people. But I think persons with disabilities would be some of those most greatly affected. So I'll stop there. Um, there's no doubt many more specific examples one could give relating AI and disability. But in this brief presentation, my aim was simply to give you a sense of the kinds of concerns I think we should not lose sight of, despite the real benefits that will be uh, highly visible soon. We can, I think, avoid these pitfalls, but it's only if we recognize them and if we commit ourselves at the outset to strategies for counteracting them. And it remains to be seen if and how well we will do so. I hope we do. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Jennifer. And we're going to turn over now to Betsy. Hello there. Hi, as Michael said, I'm, I'm Betsy Bowman and I'm the CEO of Benetech. And what we do is actually develop and implement software for social good that focuses on inclusion, equity, and justice. And we've been developing and implementing accessibility and human rights tools for almost 20 years. So I come at this as a technology person who is really concerned about making sure that people with disabilities have the most access to you know, all aspects of life. And today my talk is gonna focus really on the big picture of opportunities and threats around AI for people with disabilities and also solutions. I think there have been a lot of discussions about threats over the last year or so uh, with AI. Uh, for lots of people. And I do think, you know, 2020 is a great year to be talking about what are all the solutions. So first, let's talk about some of the opportunities. And you've heard, you've heard some from the previous two speakers. Um, and I think there are broad opportunities. Technology in general can really improve access to education, employment, social engagement, healthcare, transportation, many areas. And with AI, there, there's really opportunities in each of these areas to basically supercharge this access. First, you can and look just at consumer technology, which is heavily AI driven. Um, first, you bring a lot of lower cost. One, one issue with a lot of specialized assistive technologies over the years is they've often been expensive, which becomes a real problem for affordability for people with disabilities. Um, some examples of that in, in our work it includes ability to access content and reading tools. There's so much more access now because of technology in general. But when you start then saying, well, what about with AI? One of the areas that I think is a great opportunity are around consumer technology. So think about smart home tools. For people with disabilities, this could mean everything from better access to devices in their home, better access to streaming content for somebody who's blind, for example. Uh, and in addition, better access to healthcare when needed. And it can make things possible that weren't even really possible before. One of the examples I think about there is around auto captioning. So you can see an improvement as you, you look now online with videos being captioned for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, or frankly, just for people who have their sound off. Um, one of the things that's really useful in technology for people with disabilities 
is the ability to actually say that this technology can benefit many people. We often talk about curb cuts, or in this case, digital curb cuts, that really can benefit more people. What that means is you end up with economies of scale, and it means that you end up with these very useful, accessible tools available more broadly. And one of the other areas that I think about a lot with consumer technology and smart homes are, are really actually diving much deeper into helping people that are severely disabled or seniors. One of the issues we have going on in the world right now is, is a huge caregiver crisis. And that means that there are just not enough people to be in the homes of people with severe disabilities. Now, technology can't replace everything people can do, but it can certainly augment some of the caregivers' work. And there are a number of groups that are looking at these opportunities and actually running services that are starting to leverage AI-driven consumer technology more. And that really gives us the opportunity to, to see how we can balance the two. Um, so I think there's a lot there in consumer technology in the home that have a lot of potential for people with disabilities, and I think we're just at the beginning of those. Similarly, smart cities are a, a huge topic of conversation. Um, you can imagine much more efficient transportation. AI can help make better route planning um, for public transit, even with private transit. Uh, people who are unable to drive can get multiple kinds of transportation, whether it's ordering a car to come to your home um, or having better information about the public transit systems. Um, and, you know, smart cities go way beyond transit. And they're, they're, again, huge opportunities for making the built environment just work better for people with disabilities. Um, I think, you know, there, there are a bunch of other examples of opportunities of how AI can help. Uh, I think a lot about plain language. So for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, one of the big issues of interacting with policy, with civic engagement, uh, with education, are around the language used. So you can imagine much more potential for uh, auto conversion of language to something that is more understandable on a real-time basis. Um, similarly, other content accessibility, some of the work that we're doing since we provide books to people with print disabilities, people who can't read standard print, that's great. We do, we do text uh, like crazy, but one of the issues that gets harder is how do you make math and chemistry and other topics more accessible? Well, one of the ways is using AI to actually plow through a bunch of content and figure out which content is math and how you can make that math then accessible. So I think lots of opportunities there. Um, another big opportunity area that is really still fairly untapped are around personalized interfaces, interfaces to this digital world we live in, uh, that we're living in a lot these days, uh, really are still in the early days of being usable um, more in a more personalized way. And the idea that you take a bunch of data to figure out what everybody needs has sort of been the norm for how you think about how AI is used in a lot of technology. I think there's a huge opportunity to take AI and machine learning and figure out how you can make my interface more usable for me. Because over time, I'm gonna keep generating a lot of data about how I use stuff, and that data can be used to make the next interface better or the interface I'm already using even better. So, in short, I think there are a bunch of opportunities uh, for AI to really benefit people with disabilities, but then there are also some threats. And um, I think Jennifer talked about a couple of those threats, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit a few of these again from the broad perspective around where I think we have some real issues to work out to make all these opportunities come to light. Um, you know, one, the, the big, big view is, is AI gonna entrench inequality more? So there's already huge inequities and inequalities in the world for people with disabilities. Is AI just gonna make that worse? Because typically, as we see uh, around uh, the world today, there's a lot of bias in the data. So data that are used for the machines to figure out the algorithms tend to come from a group of people that don't always include people with disabilities. So 
you know, there are great examples in this with uh, facial recognition and using tools for hiring, for example. If you are measuring right now my facial engagement with the camera, I may be looking right at it. If I were blind, would I be looking right at that camera? Um, that's, that's a huge negative for somebody that may have absolutely nothing to do with their qualifications for the job. Yet, today, many companies are using tools that do in fact screen people out. And you can imagine this being an issue for a lot of individuals culturally, but also not just somebody who's blind, somebody on the autism spectrum, for example, might not engage the same way, but might be super qualified for that job. So I think that's, that's probably one of the more known areas, but we should also be thinking about some of those great opportunities I mentioned for self-driving cars and other, other areas that are still a problem for people with disabilities. There's a researcher, Yuta Trevoranis, at OCAD University in Toronto, who's been doing some work with self-driving car data and actually showing how people that are edge cases, people with disabilities, and particularly people whose disabilities and their accommodations make them look different than many others, actually get run over by self-driving cars if you, if you really play that data out. And the problem is that data bends to the mean. So more data actually makes it more likely that those people are actually going to get, you know, theoretically run over by these cars. So there are a lot of uh, dangers with how we think about using the data and especially for people um, out supposedly, you know, if you think about it on the edges. Um, and I think Jennifer made a great point, which is disability is often lumped together. There are many differences. There are huge differences between the way somebody who's blind interacts with the world and somebody who's in a wheelchair interacts with the world. Um, on top of that, um, the even within that, Utah's data was actually looking at somebody who uses their wheelchair in a reverse direction. So cars actually wouldn't probably hit the person in the wheelchair going forward, but they don't expect that person to go backward. That's a small group, but that's a real group of people. So how can we avoid that is one of the big questions. I think the other area when we start talking about consumer technology is privacy. Uh, big tech has your data and what do they do with it? Uh, all of these great enabled tools are wonderful. It's enabled with all of our data. So what happens to that data? And I think particularly we're talking in many cases about very vulnerable people. This whole topic of this seminar is on disability and dependency. If you now are one of those people who are more dependent on this technology, is your data going to actually be used against you, maybe even unwittingly? Um, again, even things like smart cities, one of the issues comes into place that you know, you've got a lot more potential for exclusion when everything is, say, based on a kiosk and there's no human to intervene when, again, your data gets a little bit out of the norm. I think the whole other area is poverty. Um, the stats for people with disabilities and poverty are stark. And I think especially when you get to the developing world, you really have yet, you know, a double, double whammy against those people with disabilities who are in deep poverty and, and really need some of these tools, yet are they gonna get them? Are they gonna work for them? Are they gonna be implemented to work for them? So that's, that's a lot on threats. And I guess one of the questions then is what are the solutions? And you know, it's not easy. There are many, many factors that have to weigh into the solutions on this. Um, one area that uh, I think is, is near and dear to my friend Michael Stein is policy. Um, the legal frameworks in the world are always behind technology developments. And I think that's never more true than right now. Policy in general is just struggling to catch up with the artificial intelligence wave and it's moving really fast. So there's less and less time for policymakers to learn about these things in order to make good policy. And I think uh, you know there are some really good examples in Europe where they're a bit ahead of the United States and many other areas in thinking about things like what are the transparency uh, dynamics of this world. So if, if I could go in and say, look at a data set and see, is that data set really biased or not? That'd be great, but most of these data sets are completely closed. So how do we have enough transparency to the algorithms and the data sets to actually, as civil society, be able to judge those and see if they can be either made more um, uh, inclusive or if maybe they already are? And I think when you start to talk about that, though, there are some, that's a really big conundrum when we talk about the topic of healthcare. 
how do you make data sets transparent without violating privacy? So there's, there's a real uh, balancing point. I think the other piece are equitable data sets. So if you don't include people in the data set with disabilities, then you're going to really not have very good algorithms that come out of those. There's a global recognition around national data sets. There's something called the Washington Group Questions that when you do surveys, you need to help differentiate by functional capability so that, again, you don't lump everyone with a disability into the same group. Um, finally, more balanced data. Yuta Trevoranis that I mentioned actually talks about a lawnmower of justice, so bringing down that curve of data so that you slice down the mean a little bit. I think there also needs to be a fertilizer of justice in this case because there's just not enough data about people with disabilities and that really reflect what's going on in their lives, how technology and just the real world are impacting them. And so that's something else that Benetech is working on is really working on something called data for inclusion around how do we collect more data with these more broad range definitions about functional capability and provide that so that there are balanced data sets out there. And finally, the big answer is inclusion. People with disabilities have to not only be included with the data, they have to be included in the tech development. So people with disabilities need to be developers, they need to be data scientists, and in part, it means companies need to look at them as employees. Um, and there are great examples of how to boost that up. There's an organization called Teach Access that has all the big tech companies really pushing for colleges and universities to train their engineers and designers in accessibility. And then you can take that one step further with AI. So there are a number of tools and opportunities, I think, in all of these areas to make the policy better and make the inclusion better. And you know, I look forward to you know, being one of those people working across a broad spectrum of civil society, healthcare, academia, technology industry to really make the world a more inclusive and equitable place. Thanks. Thank you so much, Betsy. And we have um, four minutes, and so I will unfairly ask the panelists in one a minute or less for their absolute best recommendation on how do we include persons with disabilities not by proxy and not by in their best interest and not by what we think they might want but instead as active participants and Betsy you touched a little bit about that but going back on the panel Betsy Jennifer and Noel one minute what do you think <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I think I'll, I'll let, uh, let some other folks go first. Um, I'm not sure I have very good solutions because I'm not as knowledgeable about what's happening. So I would really love to hear as well you know, what other people think. What are some of the best ways? I can toss out one specific, uh, and then I'd love to hear from Noel as well, which is you know, that whole idea about making sure that people with disabilities are employees. Um, you know, there are groups that, that help make sure that organizations can hire people with disabilities that are highly qualified. And I think more emphasis on that needs to be the case because that also leads to economic empowerment, which leads to other good things. So I think that's just critical. I would weigh in uh, that for the better part of, for more than a decade, actually, we've uh, locally identified a, a community-based organization in relationship with uh, several community members, including senior centers um, and care homes that care for populations with disabilities. And although it starts with uh, members of the community and, and patients with disabilities who, you know, a few, a few I might call outliers who really want to contribute to things, want to contribute to the betterment of uh, the care for the population, uh, identifying those and offering opportunities to bring, the, bring that group in uh, for a bit, like I said, for a better part of, a, of a, more than a decade, we've uh, engaged that group in uh, not only uh, just a dialogue about here's what we're thinking from a project or a development or creating tools. Do you like it? Do you not like it? How would you do it differently? What does it look like to you? How would you interact with it? Um, there are members of the community who want to contribute, so we start with those. Uh, the challenge is, is, you know, how well does that does that particular opinion or small group of opinions relate to all all uh, related partners of the community. Um, but it, 
it doesn't happen overnight and it takes investing in relationships uh, and that takes time. But once you've got a relationship, an existing relationship, cultivating it by making that part, making the members of that group feel valuable, feel valued and feel like they're contributing to something really helps. All right. So a wonderfully rich panel. And I would just add my own two cents, which is when we speak about people with disabilities, we also have to remember that those that are even considered within the disability community not to be able to express their preferences, people with intellectual disabilities, cognitive disabilities, psychosocial disabilities, who aren't even on the radar as possible employees and participants in many of these and other schemes need to have their voices heard because they know their lives better than everyone else. So thank you all. Um, thank you for the panel and I will turn it over to Carmel Shachar to introduce our keynote speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing Gerilyn Miller, who is the Director of Health Strategies at the Microsoft AI for Good Research Lab. When we initially started building this program, we of course immediately thought of the work that Microsoft is doing. Microsoft has the AI for Good portfolio, which started with AI for Earth, but then moved in 2018 to work in AI for Accessibility, where it's been giving seed grants to promising technologies that improve disabilities. They recently launched AI for Health, which aims to empower researchers and organizations with AI to improve the health of people and communities around the world. Gerilyn has been a key part of these initiatives. She, before her current role, was director of genomics for AI and research. She also has an excellent op-ed that she published in the fall for Time Magazine where she wrote about the possibility that AI could incite radical change in healthcare with the ability to shift focus from treating to preventing disease, continuously monitoring health and reducing clinician burnout. In her op-ed, she counseled that to be truly successful with AI, we will need to overlook the things that historically set us apart, like race, gender, age, language, culture, socioeconomic status and domain expertise given that history it won't be easy. I would add disability here to this long list. I think, Jennifer, I think Gerilyn thinks very closely about these issues and we are very lucky to have her. So with that, I turn the floor over to you, Gerilyn. Great, thank you very much. I'm going to share. Let me know when you see um, some bits coming across. Yep, we can see it. Great, thank you very much. Um, before I start, I'm gonna give you a caveat. Um, so I'm in Seattle, Washington, and our governor uh, last night recently announced that we're in what California was calling a shelter from, uh, at home. Washington, we're calling it, uh, you know, stay home, stay healthy, stay safe. Um, so I am operating on limited bandwidth. Um, I will do my best. Um, with what I have in terms of bandwidth, I'll pause between slides to let the, the new slide paint. And I'm going to be um, doing something a little risky at one point and sharing a video. Um, so as we do that, I just ask for your patience um, in this trying time. So with that, um, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, good evening. Um, my name is Geraldine Miller, and I'm a director on the AI for Health team at Microsoft where I am the health strategist and technical advisor to our chief data officer, Don Cahan. Today I'm going to be sharing with you how we believe that AI can address both disability and health. Um, I'm bringing this presentation to you not only as a technologist working in the, in the field of AI, but also as a person whose life has been impacted through sharing it with individuals who had um, uh, motor disabilities. My brother, within weeks of his birth, was uh, diagnosed with CP. My grandfather developed MS in his third. And um, a close family member, an immediate family member, um, had a serious accident that uh, led him to a state where he had motor impairment. 
although each of these individuals in my life ended up in a similar space with respect to their ability or lack thereof to interact with the environment and, um, and had limited mobility, they each came at it from a very different place. And what I would call out um, in terms of when I talk to my colleagues about, you know, getting a framework for understanding of this is every person brought a different experience based on um, their life story. And so each of them had not only different needs, but, but different desires and different things that they wanted as well. So with that, um, let's go ahead and launch some discussion around the things that Microsoft is doing in the area of disability. And then we'll also talk a little bit about some things that Microsoft is doing in the area of health. So in some ways, society has made a lot of progress in addressing the health of the world population. For example, child and maternal mortality has been cut in half since 1990. That's a great thing. But the reality remains that there are still over a billion people or about 15% of the world's population that have some form of ability. There's about 110 to 190 million adults that have significant disabilities or significant dis uh, difficulties in functioning. And disability disproportionately affects vulnerable populations. Lower income countries have a higher prevalence of disability than higher income countries. I don't think that comes as a surprise uh, to most of us. Um, but disability is also more common among women, older people, and children, and also adults who are poor. And furthermore, the rates of disability are increasing in the population due to aging of the population and also increases in chronic health conditions, among other causes. People with disability also have less access to healthcare services. And therefore, they typically experience more unmet healthcare needs. In fact, one half of people with disability cannot afford basic healthcare. At Microsoft, we believe that advancements in technology can be a force multiplier in unlocking solutions for some of the greatest challenges facing society, especially for the 1 billion plus people with disabilities. Yet to bring this technology to the world requires skill sets. And 50% of AI professionals today work in tech, not the nonprofit, or in many cases, serving these at need populations. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about what Microsoft is doing in this area under an initiative called AI for Good. At Microsoft, we believe that bring the skills that we have in the area of data science and computer science to the world is not an opportunity, but rather an obligation. The Microsoft AI for Good program is a $125 million program over five years. It's a philanthropic investment that is focusing on bringing AI to the world's greatest challenges. The program addresses a series of initiatives ranging from inaugural AI for Earth program, where we're looking at environmental things, um, to AI for accessibility, and more recently, at the, end of January, at the end of January, we announced our AI for Health program. So today I'm going to share with you, uh, to begin with, some work that we're doing under the AI for Accessibility initiative, and then we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about prevention and the work that we are doing in AI for Health. I can be a game changer for people with disabilities. We're already witnessing, witnessing this as uh, people with disabilities expand their use of computers and mobile phones to help them hear, see, and reason with impressive accuracy. At Microsoft, we've been putting to work solutions such as real-time speech to, to text transcription, visual recog recognition services, and also predictive text functionality. AI offers enormous potential by enabling people with vision, hearing, cognitive, learning, mobility disabilities, and mental health issues. More in three specific scenarios. These are the scenarios that the AI for Good team is focusing on. The first one is employment. The second one is daily life. And the third one is really modern life and human connection, or what we call communication and connection. 
around the world, only one in 10 people has access to assistive, assistive technology. So that's one in 10 people with disabilities uh, that have asked technology. Microsoft, we believe that if we make AI solutions more widely available, that the technology can impact this important community. Thus, some of our work um, in the AI for accessibility space. So I'm going to segue into a discussion of, of, of two projects that we'll go into in depth and case studies of the work that we're doing. Um, and then we'll uh, uh, play a little video. So approximately 2.5 million adults in the US are on the autism spectrum. 5% of those uh, 2.5 million adults are able to work, but are either unemployed or underemployed. The first project I wanna discuss is, is work that we did with the Frisch Center for Autism and Innovation at Vanderbilt. The Frisch Center, cent uh, Center focuses on using engineering technologies to transform the uh, workplace for the neurodiverse. The AI for Accessibility team gave a grant when the program first started Based on the success of this in, uh, initiative, the project was actually selected for, which is currently in progress. So the goal of this um, project was, was simple, right? Um, address the issues that neurodiverse people have in an interview situation by enabling them to practice an interview situation wanted to create a virtual reality app that could help someone with autism do this practice in their own home. So here's how the app works. And I'm going to give you a verbal of this, and unfortunately I can't give you a visual of it today. The candidate puts on a virtual reality headset at home. They open an app and they choose options regarding the discipline for the interview. For example, am I interviewing for a position? Back, and I, am, I a, am I a lawyer? Am I interviewing for a position in the legal sector? A virtual interview, then the interviewer then asks the candidate, the interviewee, questions, and then the candidate answers. The app adjusts the answers. So you can kind of think of this like it's a, an adaptive QA chat bot of sort. Um, and the app also kind of behind the scenes, not only collects the answers themselves, but is recording information such as heart rate and eye contact. After the interview or the virtual interview is complete, the candidate gets suggestions for how to improve the interview. So this project actually received a $1 million grant from the NSF, and it was, um, they were fortunate enough to also be heard in a 60-minute segment. Another interesting way that this type of work could be leveraged be able to share what is learned from this project with employers who are crafting interview questions. So the goal here would be to, to help employers understand how they can um, provide a more diverse interview experience types of questions and the manner in which these interviews are conducted. So let's segue to seeing AI. So Seeing AI is an app that was built with and for the blind and low vision community. It uses computer vision to aid in navigating and interacting with the physical world. The app has kind of an interesting background story, which I'll share a little bit about. It was actually the result of a hackathon that was done in 2015. So it didn't start as a desire to build a, a product for accessibility. It started as a passion project. And it was later released to the public in 2017, and it is available today as a free app uh, for iOS. So here's how Seeing AI works. A person selects a channel on the mobile app, and then they take a picture with the app. The channel provides context-sensitive information about the picture. So say, for example, if you're in the currency channel and you take a picture of a $5 bill, the app says $5 bill. The app can also read handwriting. Um, an amazing story behind this when the handwriting uh, channel was released is it was released near the holidays. And we had all kind of feedback from people who um, were brought to tears because for the first time in their entire life, they were able to read a holiday card from a loved one. So the app also gives audible guidance to help the individual taking the picture. 
So for example, um, in certain scenarios, um, if you're on the channel that is taking a picture of a barcode, the app begins to uh, beep and change in intensity in terms of the, the frequency of the beep so that you know that the, that the picture is actually well centered. This um, ability to take the audible guidance and, and deliver back to the user of the app is something that would not have been built without the input from the blind and low vision community. Um, that is a type of thing where you have to have somebody who is um, actually experiencing it to be able to give the guidance back. Um, this app has a really active community that is continually giving feedback on, on not only on the channels and what channels should be next, but also on uh, uh, you know, what type of features should be on the individual channels. So I was planning to do this demo live on stage, read, uh, you know, bring up the app and, and share some things with Given current circumstances, well, I'm going to play a video so that you can see AI in use. Okay, and so this is the this is the tricky part. So bear with me on this because we're going to see if we uh, have to get audio. To me, life, our family, and music. They both play a huge part in my life. Technology allows me to be my own one-man band. I try to be as independent as I can, and uh, the way that I do that mostly is uh, with low-tech, which is a white cane, and high-tech, which is a phone. Seeing AI. Seeing AI is one of the biggest deals in technology, I think, at the moment for visually impaired users. It's an app that you can read almost anything, anywhere, with it. Kilburn High Road. Fashion. Workspace. Mayonnaise. It has a multitude of functions, and they all work together to produce something that you can use whenever you need it. It might even be considered to be a Swiss Army knife of apps. Of all the parts of Seeing AI, I really do think short text is the biggest of the game changers. Northwest six. Because I've never seen anything like that in any other app before. And I like being in the back of cabs or in buses and pointing it out the window and seeing what I pass on the way to places. Mobile phone MC. Services. One of the greatest things about short text for me is that if there's no one else in the house, I can sort the post into who's who. Mrs. K. Louis. Mrs. Kirsten Louis. So I don't open my wife's post and she doesn't get cross with me. Back on. Yo, Bella Andre. My man Alex. Good. Come on, Bella. 20 pounds. That's really cool. Currency is a very useful channel because sometimes it's very difficult to know what notes actually are. So with currency, I can detect that straight away. Five pounds. Job done. 2025. Well done. Scene preview. Scene is actually really cool. It's quite descriptive, really. Processing. A store filled with lots of different types of fruit. But I think that's pretty amazing. Twitterific. In my view, one of the best parts of seeing AI is the ability to read pictures from social media. Because so many times, someone will send me a picture of something that I cannot understand. So I will share that picture to Seeing AI. Scene. Probably a group of people sitting on a bench in a park. And then I'll get a description of what it is. Person. Eight-year-old boy with black hair looking happy. Seven-year-old girl with brown hair looking disgusted. <laughs> and it's changed how I can view social media. It feels like I can participate. Like, reply. Far more than I could before. Thank you for sharing. Handwriting preview. With Handwriting Channel, I was actually able to read a card from a family member last year. That's the first time I'd actually been able to do that without help. Dear Dad. That was Alex very worked. good. We can tell if Jake's been writing well, if the Handwriting tab can recognize it. That's good proof, really. We love you, Daddy. XXXXXX. <laughs> We've got lots of X's. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> the effect of having Sing AI to hand all the time is like having somebody who can see in your pocket. 34-year-old man with a beard wearing a hat looking happy. <laughs> there is so much more that I can do now that I couldn't before. You've grown up. I used to be nice. I think seeing AI really is a huge technological step down the road, and I hope that we can continue down a road like this for many years to come. Okay, you guys, hold on one second here.
Gerilyn, just making sure that you're still there with us. I am. I'm having a hard time transferring off of this. Okay, so. Uh, Are you guys, I'm struggling here to get my PowerPoint back up. Give me one second. Okay, please let me know when we see slides. Yep, we can see slides. Perfect, okay, sorry for that little bobble there. I apologize for that. So I'm gonna share with you a few more um, accessibility projects that we're doing under the AI for Accessibility. Uh, Touch on these really briefly. Uh, happy to follow up more and point you to, to the teams and the individuals that are working on. But I think they're interesting to um, uh, kind of talk about a little bit because they, they show the diversity of the portfolio. So the first one, uh, the City University of London has a project that is focused on personalizing object recognition through AI. So this is a little bit different. The system is called Orbit or Object Recognition for Blind Image Training, ORBIT. ORBIT actually personalizes object recognition using metadata and allows people to do things like, for example, identify my coat versus someone else's coat. The interesting thing about this project is that City University also has an AI curriculum where they're uh, training blind and low vision students to actually use and build their own AI tools. So a couple different components to the work happening with the City University of London. So the second project is with the University of Texas Microsoft Ability Institute. This is a partnership between Microsoft Research and AI for Accessibility. This project is a little bit different and it goes to the concerns of some of the individuals uh, earlier who were talking about data and the data that we use when we train models. So this project is focused on creating the largest data set of images captured by the blind and low vision community. So why are they doing this? So images in the data sets that run our computer vision systems were typically captured by sighted people. So when we're using these to create models for people who have blind or low vision, it's a very different scenario. When a person who has blind or low, low vision takes a photo, as input to a machine learning model. The for actual framing of the image or, or the object in, um, in the camera view is very different and that greatly impacts the accuracy of the model. So by having more data collected from individuals in the blind and low vision community who are taking these pictures, it actually makes our models better. Um, and so this is an example of how we can address some of the challenges with AI for, for the uh, disability community by addressing the underlying data. Another project is Voice IT. They're building an automatic speech recognition technology that is designed to understand non-standard speech patterns. So the goal here is that you can give individuals with speech disabilities an enhanced platform. And then uh, to wrap up on the uh, accessibility piece, I'd like to just touch briefly on a project with Leonard Chesser, which is to improve employment opportunities for people uh, with disabilities. So this entity is a nonprofit in the UK, and they have a data set of over 40,000 employment journeys for people with disabilities in India. And this partner is embarking on a multi-phase project that involves cleaning and labeling the data, and then using machine learning to understand from the data patterns and different patterns in these career journeys. 
Um, and the goal here is to eventually be able to recommend training for individuals and then certific certifications for people so that people can actually achieve on their intended uh, career trajectory. gears and talk about AI for health. Okay, so we're going to switch gears and talk about AI for health. Um, and this is focuses more on the prevention side as opposed to addressing the needs of the community of people. Um, so as mentioned earlier, this is the latest AI for Good pillar that was launched at the end of January. Um, and we have what I would call an initial capstone set of projects that we're working on, and I'll share you a few of those today. There are three areas of focus for AI for Health. The first is, for, uh, is called Quest for Discovery. This is about accelerating medical research uh, to advance prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of disease. The second bucket that these projects fall into is Global Health Insights. So this is increasing our shared understanding of mortality and longevity to protect against global health crises. Um, so this one it uses a lot of different types of data, not only necessarily health data, but for example, overlaying things like geospatial. And then the third area that we're focusing on is health equity. So reducing health inequity and improving access uh, to care for underserved populations. So the health inequity problem exists not only on a global level, um, so in different ge uh, geographies across the globe, but health inequity is also a problem, um, for example, in developing countries. There, there are, is a wide gap between um, the type of healthcare access and what is available to people based on their socioeconomic status. So let's move on to highlight a few of these projects, um, and then I'll, I'll wrap up with some fundamental pillar work that we're doing in the area of healthcare as well. So seven million people today have leprosy. Seven million people globally. And there's over 200,000 new cases a year across 145 countries. Um, a little known fact, I think, for most people is that leprosy is actually what is categorized as a chronic infectious disease. And it's, it's caused by a particular type of bacteria and transmitted via airborne exposure. Leprosy is treatable with antibiotics. It's treatable today with antibiotics, and Novartis is doing a lot of work in the uh, elimination of leprosy by donating multidrug therapy to patients via the World Health Organization. But if leprosy is treatable, then why does it still exist today? So leprosy has a long history. Uh, the first written mention of it dates back to 600 BC. Uh, historically, people were stigmatized for having leprosy. They were isolated in leper colonies. They were removed from, from the mainstream world. Um, and although there's laws today in many places that prevent discrimination against people with leprosy, the reality is that this discrimination still exists. So many of these people who have leprosy today are seeking treatment because of fear of, of uh, being discriminated against. And, and there's a stigma associated with leprosy, not only for the individuals, but for their families as well. And the, the incredibly um, heartbreaking scenario here is that um, by not receiving treatment, um, people incur permanent physical deformity and nerve damage. So once this starts down the path, um, if the person were to receive antibiotics or multidrug therapy to reverse the treatment, uh, the nerve damage once it happens is with, with uh, disabled condition. So, as I mentioned, Novartis is doing a lot of work in the multidrug therapy. Microsoft has partnered with Novartis Foundation to look at how we can apply or bring using AI a mechanism to enable people to discreetly screen for leprosy. So here's how it works. A person takes a picture of a lesion with a mobile form. A mobile phone and then answer some quick, uh, simple questions on a form. The model, the AI model, detects leprosy like lesions from the cell phone picture and the basic metadata that the person entered. If the model determines that the le lesion might be leprosy, the person is then referred to a specialty clinic for a skin slit smear or a nerve bi dot biopsy diagnosis. So 
the goal here is to enable the, the person to discreetly get an indication of, hey, do might I have this and do I really need to change my frame of reference? So right now, this is this is a work in progress. Um, we are in uh, the in the process of collecting data. Um, it's currently being collected in Brazil and India and will likely expand to other geographies. Um, and when I say we, this is data that um, Novartis Foundation um, is working to collect and it's data that Novartis Foundation um, will, will uh, keep under their guidance um, in their IRB protocols. Um, the important thing about recognizing the need to collect um, across geographies, and this goes back to some of the things we talked about um, earlier, some of the other candidates uh, uh, talked about is the need to have diversity in the underlying data that is used to create the models. Um, and so by collecting from different regions around the world, we can get uh, a diversity in terms of images with respect to differing uh, skin types and skin colors. Okay. Good Here's now and talk a little bit about diabetic retinopathy. So this is the leading or one of the leading causes of preventable blindness globally for working age adults. It's a, a very common and specific microvascular complication of diabetes. It's caused by damage to the blood vessels in the light sensitive tissue at the back of the eye called the retina. Um, and the thing about this particular disease is, is that it is preventable, but early detection is key. So optimum control of blood glucose, blood pressure, and possibly lipids are the foundation for reducing this risk, both of the development and then the actual progression of the retinopathy. So, um, okay, so if it's, if it's preventable and, and uh, um, early detection can reduce risk, why aren't people, why aren't people um, getting detected, right? Um, although there's 463 million people at risk, there are only 210 ophthalmologists worldwide. So do the math on that, right? Um, so now I'm gonna segue into how we look at this problem and what we're trying to do to address this problem. So this project is really to detect uh, di diabetic retinopathy by using computer vision to examine the vascular structure in the fundus of the eye. Um, it's actually started as a passion project for one of our data scientists whose diabetic grandmother lost her vision. Um, our data scientists built an AI model for this uh, based on a public repository, uh, repository of images of the fundus of the eye then took this model to a company called IRIS. IRIS is focused on integrating um, detection of this into the primary care visit. Rather, having, rather than having people have to go uh, separately to an ophthalmologist, they want to you know, back things up and have this be a normal part of the care visit. Um, the IRIS equipment captures a high resolution image of the back of the patient's eye and the model analyzes the Im images and determines if the patient is at risk of uh, vision damage or vision loss. So that's, a, as I mentioned, that's a work in progress, um, just as the leprosy work is as well. With that, I want to segue a little bit and talk about how, from a Microsoft perspective, uh, we look at responsible AI. All of the projects that I spoke about today and the work that we do on the AI for Good team relies on a set of fundamental underlying responsible principles. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the AI for Good program at Microsoft is a philanthropic initiative. Um, from a, um, a logistics standpoint, it sits within Brad Smith's organization. Brad Smith is uh, president of Microsoft and he's also our, uh, our chief consul. And so by placing the work um, in this group, it also enables the team to not only develop technology, but to partner with colleagues. And how do we influence um, our government as well to do the uh, 
to the Department of Interior. So let's talk through the principles, and I'll give a, a very brief example for each of these as I go. So fairness. So AI systems should treat all people fairly. Um, an example of this that I shared with the leprosy project would be, um, you know, the desire to create a model that is generalizable or applicable to all. So not just training a model on a specific skin type or skin color, but having a diverse enough set so that that model could be generalized. Um, and that, of course, um, as I mentioned, uh, re um, basically goes back to making sure that the underlying data itself is diverse. So the second principle is reliable, uh, reliability and safety. AI systems should perform, perform reliably and safely. This is extremely relevant in the area of healthcare. So probably more relevant than in possibly any of the other pillars um, that Microsoft is working on. So um, probably less, much less relevant in the AI for Earth area where we might be do, doing something like using an AI model to detect plastic in a stream. Um, I, I think this is why this is so critical for healthcare. On the AI for Good team, we partner with domain experts in the medical field and we use this what I would call cross-disciplinary model um, of partnership uh, when we create models and when we interpret data from the model. So this gives us a level of not only having the data science and computer science expertise, but also the domain expertise to make sure that what we are building is reliable from an operations or operational standpoint and also safe. So privacy. This is, a, this is a really rich area and we could we could probably go on for an hour just on this area so i'll highlight a few things that we're doing here at microsoft we design our software from the ground up to be secure so security is something that that we bolt on it, it, we are, our software is built secure by design uh, this is evidenced by the security cer certifications uh, things like iso 2700 run and so, and such for our azure products um, on the AI for Good team, we're also investing in privacy preserving technologies, such as differential privacy and synthetic data. Um, the differential privacy work is actually at Harvard IQSS, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the transparency section as well. So, inclusiveness. AI systems should empower everyone and engage people. An example of this was a Seeing AI project. Um, so this project wasn't something that, you know, Microsoft built in a lab in Redmond and threw over the wall. Rather, this was a project that was built with and for the blind and low vision community. And what came out of it was, was an application that actually works well for the very people who are going to use it. And I know that sounds so obvious, but sometimes I think that there is a, a temptation to not include people as a part of the development. And, and what, it's so critical. Uh, to do that. So I, I, you know, I touched briefly on the work, uh, the concept of differential privacy. Um, so this is work that Microsoft is doing with Harvard IQSS, and we're doing it as an open source project. Um, and the reason that we're doing this as an open source project is to offer transparency to all the developers so that they can see and understand the techniques that are used to ensure data privacy. So really, this, this accrues up to the, the value of transparency and that AI systems should be understandable. And then the last pillar of focus of area that uh, falls under the AI principles is accountability. So AI systems should have algorithmic accountability. So um, in the AI for Good team, we look at this and we demonstrate this through things like data science best practices for building and testing models. Um, making sure that we understand the places where bias can be introduced. Bias can be introduced all along the pipeline um, in the generation and creation of, of AI models. It's important to understand that. So the very algorithms that process the data that we use to create these models can be biased. They're written by human beings. The algorithms themselves can be biased. Um, the data that we use to train the models can be biased. I, I spoke a little bit about that earlier in. Um, in the leprosy example, for example, you know, the, the need to be able to include diversity in skin types and not just create 
a model that is biased because you train it on, on a, a one particular skin color and not another. So, um, so that's uh, really very important um, from the standpoint of uh, accountability, um, is to understand how bias can basically inject itself in the process of creating these models. In the healthcare space in particular, we also advocate uh, for AI-assisted detection and prevention. Um, so we look at this as um, AI and AI systems augment but don't replace. Um, and so this this concept of human in the loop in these early in the early days of AI is, is something that I think is really important um, as we as we all learn together. So with AI, we're making great progress in the area of health and uh, accessibility as well. To quote the Secretary General of the United Nations, while we still have much to do, we have seen an important progress in building an inclusive world for all. So I hope you enjoyed this brief glimpse of some of the projects that Microsoft is working on um, under the AI for Good umbrella, in particular those focused on AI for accessibility and AI for help. With that, I'd like to thank you for sharing this hour with me. I'd like to thank the listeners for your incredible patience with me and the generous hosts for their patience. Thank you. Gerilyn, thank you for your very thoughtful remarks. Before we lose you, I'd love to ask you a few questions in lieu of an audience Q&A. The first is you've walked us through a whole bunch of applications that seem really great and like they'll have some very helpful real world impacts. And I was wondering, how does Microsoft approach prioritizing certain projects, assuming that we don't have an infinitely large pot of resources? Right, yeah, that's, a, that's a great question, and thank you for asking that. And so, the, you know, we look at uh, this in a couple of areas. Um, first and foremost is that the project has to be mission aligned. So in, um, I'll take AI for Health as an example. So mission aligned to our three pet, uh, pillars, um, inequity, global health insights, um, and then also quest for discovery. Um, the projects also need to be ethics aligned. Um, and this is a really important area in healthcare. And, and um, there's sometimes projects that will come across um, our plate uh, as a part of uh, the intake process where um, we as a company just can't do this um, just because of the ethical framework and, and sometimes some of the things around the way the data was collected or, or what's in the data. And so we have an ethical framework that we operate in to be ethically aligned with the incoming projects. The third is really, you know, what's the impact of the project? Um, from our perspective, it's not enough just to publish, publish papers. Um, we have a research team that love to publish papers. Believe me, it's something that's very important to them. But if we stop just with publishing papers, then we haven't done our job. Our job is really to go beyond publishing papers and see translation of what we build into common practice. And because that is where you really get the multiplier effect in the impact. Um, and then there's a couple things I would say were a little more um, around the action project. Um, Things like um, how well defined is the research statement, right? That sometimes it's a really tricky thing in the area of AI. Um, it's new, and sometimes people have um, uh, are have a difficult time getting their head around what are the types of problems that you solve by um, applying this technique. Um, and then the second uh, area, from kind of like a logistics standpoint, would be data. Um, there's this common thing, kind of a funny thing in the data science world. Um, it sounds kind of obvious, but sometimes people tend to forget it. You can't have data science without data, right? And so we can have great aspirations, but at some point you have to have the data to build the model. And Microsoft, our approach to how we do this is um, we always partner uh, with an external collaborator. Um, so uh, the, what our grantees bring to the table um, is domain expertise, and then we um, work with the data uh, inside their environment. So we bring our computer science and data science expertise, 
um, the partners bring their uh, they bring their data, they bring their their research statement, um, and then they also bring um, their domain experts as well. So those are just a few of the things that we look at uh, for inbound projects. Um, really focusing on everything to you know alignment, philosophical alignment, ethical alignment. Um, to logistics of the particular project in, in which all lead to kind of propensity for success of the project. Geraldine, another question. So we've constructed this event to be very interdisciplinary, as I hope the audience is getting a sense. You know, we have pharmacists, we have people from the tech world, we have health law scholars, ethicists. From your experience working in this area, what do you hope the different stakeholders would understand about each other's perspectives in order to be maximally effective at tackling these issues? Yeah, thank you. Another great question. Um, I think the most important thing to remember is that this isn't, AI is not an area where any one discipline can do it alone. It's really about the intersection of different disciplines, um, not only from the you know, data science perspective, but also uh, bringing in the other perspectives um, as well. Um, when I look at how we do data science on our team, just the actual data science piece of this, right? Um, we have an extremely diverse team. And so this team um, is diverse um, from the standpoint of, of every metric you could possibly think, um, uh, age, gender, culture, ability, um, but also in terms of domain expertise, and that's really critical. So we have people um, uh, who come from different areas uh, in machine learning. So people who are, for example, experts in computer vision, experts in uh, natural language processing, um, people who have uh, ex expertise, for example, in building deep neural networks. And then also expertise from different disciplines as well. Um, so we have uh, people with background in economics, um, uh, individual from NASA. We have people with computational biology backgrounds. People uh, we have MD on staff. And it isn't any one individual um, that solves the problem or creates a model that solves the problems. It is the collective, um, diverse thinking that is brought to the problem space. And it is that collective diverse thinking um, that is the that is in there is the magic, per se. I want to explore. You mentioned that your team is very diverse across a number of different axes, and I know that in the literature, people have thought a lot about the intersection of race and AI when it comes to allocating health resources. I was wondering, how do you distinguish some of the challenges and opportunities of applying AI ethically for in the disability space, as opposed to in some other areas of diversity, such as age or gender or race? So when I step back, I look at I look at that as one segment of the type of diversity that's necessary. And so this is really about making sure that the um, underlying data that we collect is representative of the populations um, that will be served by the by the creation or by the output of right. And so again, this goes back to a deep understanding of when you're building these models and training these models, what the underlying data is. Um, and so I'm gonna, let me give you an answer to this in kind of uh, a day in the life of and how a project flows through and where we spend our time on these, right? So, you know, when we do an initial work, it's really about understanding uh, the scope of the problem. You know, what questions do we wanna ask of the data? You know, what do we hope to, uh, what, what do we hope to, um, to learn through this research and what do we hope to get out of it, right? So it's really the research statement. Um, they're the, probably the biggest part when we are uh, embarking on a data science project is really what we call data engineering. And so this is the part where um, you have to get in there, you have to roll up your sleeve, you have to look at that data, you have to understand how the data co was collected, where it was uh, collected from, um, who is represented by that data. 
um, how is it even things like you sometimes assume, but you can't assume, um, how is, is the data consented, right? Um, and so this part of understanding and getting a really good understanding of the data itself is critical um, to these type of projects. And, and there's a lot of time, it's probably the biggest time of end to end process that's actually spent understanding the data itself. And there are cases, for example, where we might not have diversity in terms of data on all different levels, um, in which case we can build a model that will um, respond to a particular slice of the population, but that model is not generalizable. Um, and, and so, you know, if the, if the goal is to use the model uh, broadly, then we need models to be generalizable, which goes, about, again, back to the data and the time spent understanding. So it's kind of a technical answer, I think. No, that was great. So I will say, as we mentioned at the start, because this is a live streaming is a new space for us, we are not taking questions through Zoom, but we are monitoring the conversation on Twitter. And somebody on Twitter raised a great question, which is, I think can be summarized as the concern about garbage in, garbage out. If we're using data that has ableist assumptions built into it, that's going to influence everything that comes out of use of the data. How do we ensure that the data gathered from the start is inclusive and represents a variety of perspectives and doesn't have some ableist assumptions baked into it? Yeah. Um yeah, so let, let me share a couple ways. Uh, number one is making sure um, that the project that I shared a little bit earlier, where we're actually doing um, a data collection um, uh, from individuals um, who are either blind or um, have low vision. Um, so part of this is, is just creating new data sets, right, where they don't exist today. Um, and that is something, um, Data science isn't always retrospective analysis, um, but it's also an understanding, hey, if, if we want to change things, there are times that we need to go ahead and collect new data going forward, um, and being able to pro, uh, provide guidance to our grantees who are doing this and helping them understand, you know, um, if you're gonna go collect data, what should you be looking for? On the AI for Good Team, we also uh, partner uh, closely across the different pillars. So it's actually the same set of data science resources um, who work on um, AI for accessibility and then the AI for health projects as well as projects. So we rely on the expertise of our, of our colleagues in the different area and the, and the program office to, um, to, help, to help guide that uh, process. So the next question that I have, Geraldine, Obviously, we are living in some very unusual times. There's a reason why we're doing this as a live stream and not trying to do this in person. How do you anticipate the pandemic and the new healthcare and social landscape that is evolving, either influencing the development of AI for disability or having tools for AI for disability addressing some of the problems that are occurring right now? So I have to tell you, I haven't specifically you know, thought about this under the lens of disability. I have given it a lot of thought about the, under the lens of equity. And I think at some level, a discussion around disability is a discussion around equity, just making sure that um, what we build um, uh, is available and suitable for all. Right, and so my hope coming out of this, and I think we're starting to see this uh, the, through, you know, kind of the whole motion of work from home from the pandemic, that um, in this process, there will be holes that we see in um, the way our society currently operates. My, my hope is that, um, you know, months from now, when we're all back to working normally, that we don't forget about these holes, right, that we can, uh, take what we learned around where the inequities exist today and take these forward um, as a new way in building a new paradigm. Um, so out of this pandemic and, and this crazy 
uh, world that we live in today, there will be good um, because we will have identified the, um, some of these inequities and we'll be able to move forward with solutions to address them. So the last question I have is a forward thinking question. Let's say that we held this event again in five years. How would you hope that the field would have evolved? Yeah, so I think, um, so as a technologist, you know, I'm going to say I, I, I feel pretty comfortable about the technology progression in this area. And maybe that's because that's my frame of reference. So you always are more comfortable with the things where your area of expertise is my frame of reference. Um, areas where I think we need some of the most work um, are really uh, in the areas around policy, right, um, and governance. Uh, we need to make sure um, that there is a framework uh, for, for the work that is happening in the, area, in the area of artificial intelligence um, and governance around this, right? Um, and as somebody, uh, one of the panelists earlier mentioned, you know, very often we see things like policy um, and actually law lag behind what's happening in the industry. So, so my hope um, is that in a few years, um we will see some of the policy things catch up so that's that's hope number one the second hope i have is more around how we share data and protecting privacy of individuals um so today in in the in the healthcare world if, if we're um, operating in the united states we, we follow the guidelines for for hipaa um, from a compliance point and, and one of the ways that we deal with healthcare information um, is through the identification of data. Um, there's a number of challenges with that from an AI perspective. Um, through, you know, data identification, GSA Harbor, you potentially end up in a scenario where that you actually uh, complete the research or to be successful with what you're trying to learn from data. Um, my hope is that some of the technologies um, that are in the wings that we're working on. So things like differential privacy, synthetic data um, will, mat will mature not only from a technology perspective, but also from a policy governance perspective. So lawmakers will, will understand this and that um, our policy today for how we operate in these spaces um, will reflect some of the advances in the technology. Those are my hopes. Great, Gerilyn. I would like to thank you again for participating in this event. Those comments were very interesting. We have our final panel coming up, which will be moderated by Sanu Thadney from the Presence Center at Stanford Medical School. Sanu, I am handing things over to you. Thank you, Carmel. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start by thanking our colleagues at the Petrie Flom Center who've led this endeavor and the moving targets we've been working with over the last year, and especially the last few weeks as we planned this event. A very special thanks to Glenn and to Carmel and to your teams. Thank you. So we at the present center at Stanford Medicine are very privileged to be collaborating with all of you on this effort and focus. And by the way, our faculty director, Dr. Abraham Verghese, sends his regrets from the clinical front line where he's needed much more. A quick word about presence. Our focus is on the humans in the clinical and connected world and how do we leverage technology for equitable human-centered solutions in healthcare. We cannot forget that the patients and their caregivers are human. We cannot forget that the clinicians and their peers in the clinical ecosystem are all human. And they, as humans, must be front and center in the AI and other healthcare innovation research and solutions. So before I dive into our panel, I want to add special thanks to two of our clinical colleagues and very dear friends who helped create today's conference 
and they were to be active participants, but, but are instead of the COVID-19 medical frontline. Firstly, our dear friend and colleague, Dr. Andrew Elder, who's the president-elect of the Royal College of Physicians at Edinburgh, at the University of Edinburgh Medical School. Andy, we miss you. We're glad you're at the front line. And secondly, Dr. Anida Mendonca, who serves as the Vice President of Research at Reagan Strife, and is also the, their interim director for their Center of Biomedical Informatics. She also has professorial roles at the Indiana School of Medicine. Anida, we miss you, and we're glad you're at the front line. I would also like to take a moment to thank all our clinical colleagues at the front line today for their bravery, their commitment, their care during this world of uncertainty and the unknown. Moving to our panel, let's define dependency. And we define it as dependency that's a function of either age, ability, illness, or injury, and it could be either short-term or long-term. Now, today, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, reflect on how much all of us are relying on technology, even for this conference or webinar, and even with the privilege that we have with my co-presenters, given our education, given the institutions that employ and support us, you saw how we struggled with the technology like Zoom, which is far more low-tech than AI, and my family and friends are using it regularly for Zoom cocktails. And many colleagues are using it for teaching online and running meetings. Now imagine the price being paid by people who are less able and less privileged populations with little or no access to things like telemedicine and teleeducation that is sadly becoming a norm today. And look at the inequity because of all of that. Finally, we are accepting far greater surveillance today in many countries to battle this, battle this pandemic. And if this surveillance continues and the data is unwittingly used against each of us, what does that mean? Perhaps we can discuss this and other related subjects as part of our Q&A, but I'd like to start out with brief introductions to our very star-studded panel and thank them for being with us today. Sharona Hoffman is on the faculty at the School of Medicine at Case Western University. She's the Edgar Hahn Professor of Law at the School of Law and the co-director of the Law Medicine Center School of Law and a professor in the Department of Bioethics and Medicine as at Case Western. Ari Neiman is a PhD student of health policy at Harvard University and founder of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. And finally, my colleague Rana Trivedi is on faculty here at Stanford and the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. So I will not take up any more time from the panel and instead turn it over to our first speaker, who I believe is Sharana. Okay, let me see. All right. Okay, hopefully I've unmuted and gotten all my technology together. It's a pleasure to participate in this, uh, in this great, great program. I've learned a lot so far. So I'm going to be talking about long-term predictions that relate to diseases that people are going to develop in the future at some point. So not current conditions that people have, but rather predictions that are made with AI concerning future health status. And I know this panel is supposed to concentrate uh, to some extent on aging. And so in fact, these predictions of heart disease and cognitive declines have to do with conditions that people develop often later in life. And I think a lot of the AI work in this area will be done with people who are older for whom these, these health problems are more imminent. So what are the different sources that are being used for research regarding future health problems? 
So predictive health analytics is often based, first of all, on electronic health records, EHRs, physiological exams, and so there's analysis of blood work to determine if uh, any biomarkers can be illuminating in terms of future health problems. Lots of eye exams, apparently. So the eyes are a window to the soul, but they're also a window to future health problems. Health insurance claims. Purchasing records. So what you buy can tell researchers a lot about your health habits, your are you eating well, your diet, your exercise, etc. Wearables, Fitbits, and other things, and social media. So what people post on the internet, on Facebook and so on, can uh, tell people about health problems they currently have, but also those that they will develop in the future, about their mood, about their habits. Uh, and Facebook has apparently also gotten into the business of trying to predict suicide. So they have looked at pairings of, um, of phrases such as, I'm saying goodbye, and then a response, please don't do this. And they will use that kind of language to predict that somebody is at risk of suicide. And I am told that they sometimes actually send the police over to people's homes to do wellness checks. Another source is data brokers. Um, this is an emerging industry uh, and one that is growing very rapidly. There are some well-known industry giants such as Axiom and LexisNexis, and then there are a whole lot of other companies and the number is growing all the time. Something to note about data brokers is that they are not governed by HIPAA. They are not governed by the privacy rule. And so they actually, whatever data they have, they can disclose it to third parties uh, without the patient's consent. And so indeed what they do is they gather, process, and sell information to any interested third parties, which can include employers, insurers, and the like. What kind of long-term predictions are being made using all of these different sources? Well, a whole lot of them. So researchers are looking at electronic health records and other sources to make uh, predictions about heart disease and stroke Apparently, eye exams, as I mentioned, uh, problems in the vessels of the eyes can indicate future heart problems. Diabetes, cancer recurrence. Uh, there's a big project here at my university, Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, where they are looking at images of various tumors and using AI to analyze them in order to determine which ones are more aggressive, which ones require chemotherapy, and which ones might recur. Cognitive decline. Um, retinopathy, which we just heard about, can also be used to indicate future cognitive decline. So they've developed some algorithms that can analyze uh, eye problems and indicate that that is associated with possible cognitive decline. Depression is also being predicted. Future opioid abuse. So researchers have looked at electronic health records and insurance claims and come up with algorithms that predict future opioid abuse. And I'm told that some of these predictions are actually being sold because that can be important for third parties to know. Psychosis, speech patterns apparently have been analyzed for indications of psychosis and suicide I already mentioned. One issue is that these long-term predictions could be included in electronic health records, in EHRs. And if they are included in your EHR, they can be viewed by anyone with access to your record 
for treatment, payment, or healthcare operation purposes. So the HIPAA privacy rule does not cover disclosures for purposes of treatment, payment, or healthcare operations, TPO, and lots of people look at your record for these purposes. So I read a study that said that in a typical hospitalization, at least 150 different individuals are going to look at the patient records. They can also be viewed by anyone that you authorize to access your EHRs, and people do so quite regularly. According to some research, these authorizations are signed millions of times a year. And so employers often ask applicants for authorization to look at their records after an offer of employment is made, presumably in order to determine if these uh, individuals are qualified for the job. But once they have the information, who knows what they do with it. When you apply for life insurance or long-term care insurance, you will often be asked to sign an authorization um, so that people can look at your electronic health record in order to make a judgment about whether they want to insure you. And those are just a few examples. So what are the um, concerns with AI? Well, one of course is privacy. If you have these predictions uh, that you may get cognitive decline or heart disease or a stroke, that is information you may well not want disclosed to others. And uh, once it's in your EHR or once a data broker has it, that can certainly be uh, disclosed to third parties. One reason that that's particularly a problem is we worry about discrimination by employers or insurers or others. So employers have a lot of incentive to not want people who are going to get sick in the future. Um, if they think you're going to get sick, they're going to worry about absenteeism problems, productivity problems, and most importantly, um, health insurance costs because somebody who's going to need extensive medical treatment is going to be ex expensive. And of course, about 60% of workers these days are covered by self-insured employer plans, which means that the employer pays out of pocket for every medical claim. And insurers, uh, long-term care insurers, hope to have people who won't need long-term care, of course, and so if they can determine that you will, um, they are going to deem you ineligible for insurance. Uh, life insurers, disability insurers have similar incentives. Another thing that I worry about is psychological harm. So if doctors are going to start obtaining these kinds of long-term predictions using AI. They may discuss their findings with patients, but you have to worry about what the implication is for the patient. So for example, I am absolutely terrified of uh, having cognitive decline in the future. Every time I forget something, I think here it goes. And I absolutely would not want to have a prediction of cognitive decline based on any sort of evidence. I think that would cause me a lot of psychological harm. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way. And these concerns are exacerbated by the fact that you could get erroneous predictions, that AI is imperfect. And we've already heard some uh, statements about this today. And so if your source is electronic health records, electronic health records are infamous for having a lot of errors in them. There are studies of error rates in EHRs, and those error rates are very high. And I had a good example a couple of weeks ago. I, I had a sore throat, and so I went to the doctor back when that was easy to do, and the nurse took my vitals, and she took my temperature, and later I saw the entry in my personal health record, and she had recorded my temperature as being 208.3 degrees, 
instead of 98.3 degrees. And I thought, wow, in this coronavirus era, we absolutely don't want that kind of temperature on our record. So that's an example of an EHR error. And we've also heard about biases, and that is certainly applicable here. So your data, the, the training data that is used for your algorithms could be biased. It could include records just from people who are white or people who are younger or people who are wealthy or whatever. And that's called selection bias. That means that whatever outcomes are true for uh, the training data that you have used are not necessarily generalizable to a larger population. They apply to the population that was tested, but not to a larger population, and therefore they are not generalizable. Okay, so this is a law conference and I'm a law professor. So let me talk a little bit about what needs to be done to address these concerns in terms of legislative reform. So HIPAA, I've written a lot about this and others have written a lot about this. The HIPAA privacy and security rules are too narrow. So they apply only to healthcare providers health insurers, healthcare clearinghouses, and their business associates. They do not apply to all sorts of other people that handle health information, such as data brokers, Facebook, the government, all sorts of people. And so if these parties get predictions, long-term care prediction, long-term predictions, they may well disclose it without violating HIPAA. And so I think we need to expand the definition of covered entity, of who is covered by HIPAA, so that it really includes anyone who is handling health information for business purposes. Another point that I've been making is that there is a problem with our anti-discrimination laws. The prime example is the Americans with Disabilities Act, but we have a lot of other anti-discrimination laws at the federal level and all the states have them. And those anti-discrimination laws do not cover predictions of future health problems. So they generally define disability as a current disability a record of a disability, so a past disability, or being regarded as disabled, being regarded as currently disabled, even if you are not. But what they don't cover is discrimination based on predictions of your being sick in the future. And so I think that an employer, for example, could say to you, look, I realize you're perfectly healthy now, you haven't had any health problems that have troubled me, but I have a prediction that in five years you will develop cognitive decline or some other serious health problem, and so I don't want you in my workforce. And I think that is perfectly legal under current law. And so I think these laws have to be revised now that we have these AI capabilities so that they cover individuals who are regarded as likely to develop physical or mental impairments in the future. And that would cover these long-term predictions. A few other recommendations that I have. Uh, clinical practice guidelines as to AI use. So when genetic testing emerged, we developed clinical guidelines. We were pretty thoughtful about it. When should people undergo genetic testing? A consensus developed pretty much that children, for example, should not be tested for Huntington's disease, which is a horrible uh, neurological disease. It's untreatable. You develop it later in life. So don't test children. Let them make their own decisions once they are no longer minors. And so we should be thinking about when to use AI and what kind of guidelines we need about that. 
We also need careful validation of algorithms. We heard about that, but we want to minimize the chance that they are biased or that they are based on erroneous data so that we don't get a lot of wrong predictions. And finally, I think that we should develop the capability to offer counseling to patients who are considering pursuing AI-based long-term predictions. Again, in the area of genetic testing, we develop the whole service industry of genetic counseling, who do a pretty good job of providing assistance to patients, helping them think through, do they wanna undergo genetic testing? How should they understand their genetic test results? Um, should they disclose them to other family members? And how do they deal with them once they have them? And so similarly, if we are going to be giving patients AI-based long-term predictions, I believe that they should have the support that they need, that they should be able to think through, is this gonna be of benefit? They should be able to interpret it correctly and they should get support to deal with those predictions once they have them. And so all this and more is found in a law review the, uh, article that was published in January in the North Carolina Law Review. I called it what genetic testing teaches us about predictive health analytics regulation. So it's on the internet, you can take a look at that. And I think I will stop here and turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you so much, really appreciate that. Um, moving next to our next panelist, who I believe is Ari. Hello, let me just share my screen and we will be ready to go. Excellent. Is that coming through? Are you able to see my slides? Yes. Okay. Um, right. So one of the topics that I think uh, has been alluded to by some of my colleagues and, and bears a little bit more going into um, is the question of exactly what purposes we are going to uh, make use of AI for in the context of disability. And one of the great challenges that uh, merges in disability service provision, disability policy, and conversations around bioethics in the broader context of disability um, is the focus, uh, is the difficulty in ascertaining um, what constitutes a good outcome for people with disabilities uh, and how that may be different or at cross purposes with society's expectations for people with disabilities or the larger disability community. And it, am I still sharing? I, I think I'm getting a message indicating that uh, sharing has been paused. I don't know if that's, we're still sharing my screen. Did we just move forward a slide or not? Your slide didn't move forward, but uh, why don't you keep talking and I'll be in contact with our colleagues to address the technology. Sorry about that. Sure, sure, not a problem. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from George Box, all models are wrong, but some are useful. I think that has a real resonance within the context of um, discussions of AI and disability. Uh, today we've talked about, broadly speaking, four problems with regards to AI and disability. First, is information going to be private? Second, is information going to be used to discriminate? Third, is the information going to be lead, uh, used to lead to accurate conclusions? And the fourth is the, model, is the problem I wanna focus on, what goals should we build our models to optimize for? I want to highlight three problems in the context of disability policy, service provision, and bioethics um, that each present potential concerns um, when we think about how artificial intelligence may be applied um, to their solutions. One is the question of autonomy versus health. 
a very significant component of public service provision for people with disabilities it comes in the form of long-term services and supports. Over the course of the last 60 years, there has been a tremendous focus on bringing people with disabilities out of institutional settings um, and into home and community-based services. Uh, and you know, one of the accidents of history is that our country's primary payer for long-term services and supports is the Medicaid program, a health insurance program. But the focus of disability advocates has been to demedicalize uh, long-term services and supports, to move service provision out of large institutional hospital-like settings and towards more individualized home-like settings. And often in the process, to shift from the traditional medical approach of a provider um, articulating a set of goals that are similar uh, across uh, a broad range of similar patients to a more individualized person-centered approach that varies goals based upon the preferences and priorities of the individual and may involve the individual receiving services having significantly more authority um, than the provider, uh, including in um, very specific questions with regards to how services are delivered. Now, uh, over the course of the last 50 years of deinstitutionalization, we've collected a fair amount of research on how effective deinstitutionalization is in changing outcomes for people with disabilities. Um, there's a fair amount that shows that people with disabilities tend to realize benefits in terms of a wide variety of dimensions of skills as a result of leaving institutions. There's also a small amount of research that shows that when people leave congregate settings, whether we're talking about traditional institutions or group homes or other types of congregate settings, people tend to see um, reductions in certain measures of preventative health and primary health care. Um, and, and generally speaking, most disability advocates, and I would say most policymakers, uh, would agree that that trade-off is worth it. We need to do a better job at serving people with disabilities, uh, healthcare needs in the community. But very few people articulate the idea that the skill change improvements, and more importantly, the autonomy improvements, the opportunity to make your own decisions about what you do during the day, the opportunity to um, control where you live with and with whom, the opportunity to control your own daily schedule, all kinds of things that don't tend to happen in institutional settings or large congregate settings. Most people agree that those benefits outweigh any marginal reduction that may emerge um, in uh, preventative or primary health care by virtue of leaving a congregate setting. But you see, one of the challenges that we may run into as we begin to rely more and more on artificial intelligence um, and uh, various algorithms for the making of decisions within the context of uh, healthcare service provision is which goal do we optimize around? Considering what maximizes autonomy is a highly individualized process. We don't even have consistent um, uh, consensus uh, measures for evaluating uh, what uh, it delivers the best possible autonomy outcomes across different uh, residential uh, employment and day service provision settings. And so there's a very real risk that if we see um, artificial intelligence and algorithmic interpretation focus uh, on long-term services and supports as a healthcare service, delivered in the context of the Medicaid program, which is a health insurance program, that we may see backsliding um, from the long-standing progress disability rights advocates have made to demedicalize these services, to emphasize autonomy rather than a simple focus on health.
I think that represents a, a very real concern that needs to be weighed, even as we acknowledge the fact that artificial intelligence does present, um, if we put it to work on answering the right questions, real opportunities in long-term services and supports as well. People with disabilities may significantly benefit from predictive analytics that, that target interventions to them um, prior to the risk of being institutionalized or being hospitalized. That may serve as an important tool that can help address the woodwork effect, the fear that many payers and policymakers have that an expansion in the availability of home and community-based services will not result in cost savings uh, because even though HCBS uh, are per capita, uh, generally less expensive than institutional care, um, there is, uh, I would say, a somewhat well-founded risk um, that when you offer a more appealing benefit, uh, like home and community-based services, more people will take it up uh, than in the context of a less appealing benefit, like institutional care. There may be opportunities to use predictive analytics to target resources towards those who are at greatest risk of institutionalization, which um, may create an opportunity for state Medicaid agencies and other payers in the long-term services and support space to feel more comfortable with the expansion of service provision. But in order to do that, again, we have to operate under the assumption that we are not simply seeking to optimize around health of a health insurance program, but instead also looking to considerations around autonomy as well, and I would argue first and foremost in the context of long-term services and supports. I also want to highlight another issue that's emerging right now within the context of the coronavirus. Some of you are very familiar with um, the discussions that have taken place over the last week over how society should allocate scarce medical resources like ventilators um, or staff time of skilled personnel uh, in areas where there are serious shortages emerging as a result of COVID-19. Um, this is an area where uh, we are seeing um, dramatically conflicting perspectives. Some of you have, may have seen um, Zeke Emanuel and a few colleagues as op-ed in the New York Times, um, arguing uh, for um, considering a number of factors in the context of rationing decisions, but two that they argued for quite passionately were, number one, prioritizing um, for life-saving treatment uh, individuals uh, who can be served more efficiently. Uh, the argument is that if you have uh, an individual who may require twice or three times the amount of time on a ventilator um, than uh, is the average, then even if that individual presents in the ICU first and needs immediate treatment in order to save their life, um, a utilitarian uh, optimization process should take place to ascertain, to uh, conclude that by serving this individual who will require twice or three times the time on a ventilator, the person after them um, will no longer, oh, uh, the two or three people after them will not receive uh, service. And as a result, they should be denied access to service provision. Some of you may have also seen um, my op-ed yesterday arguing the exact opposite. The issue that we run into when trying to um, apply uh, AI and algorithmic interpretation to these kinds of questions um, is that if we take a simple approach of maximizing the number of life years saved, let alone the number of quality adjusted life years saved, uh, it's very difficult to argue against the position articulated by Emmanuel et al. Um, and we run into some very serious ethical questions because when we extrapolate that outward, we begin to realize that there are very few circumstances under which uh, people without disabilities cannot be served more efficiently uh, than people with disabilities. 
So that may have the implication that in the context of scarcity, people with disabilities go to the back of the line. And that has implications um, well beyond uh, just the current coronavirus epidemic. It certainly has implications in the context of other scarce medical resources, uh, like organ transplantation. Some would argue that it has implications even within the context of um, non-emergency situations for things that we don't typically see as scarce resources. For some time, we have seen arguments that there's a need for more aggressive optimization of um, uh, more everyday healthcare resources, like access to specialty pharmaceuticals. Um, and so we run into this, this very serious question that if the goal that we build our model around is maximizing life years, um, and especially if the goal that we build our model around is maximizing quality adjusted life years that discount the value of disabled life, but even if we set aside the quality issue and just look at a model that maximizes life years as a goal, there is a very real risk that disability rights law and that disability non-discrimination as a principle is not going to be articulated in a meaningful way. Most fundamental around AI and disability is how do we operationalize the concept of rights um, in terms of not clear a uh, way to incorporate that in the mathematical model. This is something that comes up often uh, in discussions around pharmaceutical value assessment, uh, where you often see um, you know, very extensive conversations on uh, the importance of um, non-discrimination uh, and, and accounting for the nuances of different individual priorities around their disabilities in the preamble and the surrounding text associated with value assessment. Um, but in the mathematical model that's utilized, uh, we often don't see these ideas clearly articulated. And there's a risk um, that in the absence of our, our thinking of a good way to operationalize rights protection within a model, um, we uh, will see increasingly untransparent approaches to optimization that um, uh, lack the visibility of um, a New York Times op-ed or a state allocation procedure for scarce medical resources to be critiqued and challenged as um, advocates have recently begun challenging state allocation procedures for state medical resources. Some of you may have seen the coverage of the Office of Civil Rights complaint filed by Disability Rights Washington, a number of other groups on that just yesterday. Finally, I wanna raise one more question um, that I think, again, goes to this issue of what goals do we endeavor to optimize for and, and how do we build our models um, to ensure that when we are asking questions about effectiveness, uh, we're asking about effective towards uh, ends that we are in agreement on um, and that are consistent with our, our shared values. Some of you may be familiar with longstanding debates around the uh, medical model and the social model of disability. I think many of you in this audience probably are very familiar with the medical and social model. Um, medical model views disability solely as an individual experience. Um, you are uh, in a wheelchair. That is why you are unable to uh, enter a building. The social between an individual and larger societal context. Um, the building you are trying to enter does not have a ramp. That is why you are not able to enter the building according to the social model. My background is in the autistic community. Uh, some of you know I co-founded and ran for 10 years the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. Um, and one of the ideas that ASAN and a wide variety of other autistic advocates have um, put forward for some time 
is that we really need to be challenging a purely medical model approach to autism that says that simply uh, autistic traits are the inevitable source of challenges faced by autistic people. And that the focus of autism intervention and service provision should simply be to try and eliminate or reduce autistic traits. It's a very long-standing problem in research and service provision around autism. Um, there's a lot of research that still today assumes that the goal of autism intervention should be uh, achieving, quote, indistinguishability from peers, uh, uh, the removal of autistic traits. But the social model approach really challenges that mode of thinking. It says that autistic traits um, are neither inherently good nor bad. Um, you know, in some ways, uh, because we as autistic people like them, uh, many of them are uh, good for us. Um, you know, some are things that we struggle with, uh, and you know, those represent areas of challenge. But the things that determine whether or not a trait constitutes an area of challenge or an area of pleasure um, are not just our individual experiences with them, but the ways in which we experience these traits within the context of a larger society and within the context of available support services and accommodations. And here we really run into, I think again, a very important question for um, discussions about how we put models to work evaluating the effectiveness of particular interventions. Because if we only focus on questions around the effectiveness in reducing certain traits, then we really ignore um, the larger context that may make those traits challenging, um, neutral, or advantageous, depending on the circumstances. If our focus is simply saying, um, we will consider an intervention effective if it uh, increases the percentage of time someone makes eye contact by a certain percent, then we don't interrogate the assumption that eye contact is an in, uh, inherently necessary uh, and worthwhile goal. Uh, and I think that's something that we really need to wrestle with. It's something that we have been wrestling with in the context of larger debates around autism service provision and treatment. I think as we begin to see um, the evaluation of uh, research data um, and clinical data uh, be done more and more um, through artificial intelligence, we need to ask ourselves um, if the results we receive on the effectiveness of particular interventions account for consideration of um, these competing values and again, these competing ideals as to what constitutes a good outcome. Ari, oh, you have the perfect slide up. I was going to tell you, you're way past time. <laughs> oh, well, I was done, so. <laughs> Thank you, really appreciate it. Um, and while we get ready to put uh, Ranak slides online, I would be remiss in not mentioning the work of 30 colleagues nationwide under the work of the National Academy of Medicine on a publication that came out a few months ago called AI in Healthcare the hope, the hype, the promise, the peril. And I'll ask our colleagues at Petri Flom to tweet it out, tweet out the link because it's free and downloadable, as well as tweet out one of the slides from that work where, to your point, Ari, the goal is to move from what we've been calling the quadruple aim in healthcare to the quintuple aim, where the fifth aim is equity and inclusion. So, um, Leaving the rest of our discussion to any time if we have it after our panel is done, I'd like to turn it over to Ranak Trivedi for her uh, presentation. Ranak, all yours. Yes, thank you, Sono. And um, Carmel, I tried one more time. I wasn't able, able to slide, uh, share the sl screens if you don't mind putting them up. Um, so while that's happening, thank you all for attending. I would have loved to see a lot of you in person, but I'm really glad that we're all staying where we are and safe and healthy, hopefully. What I'm going to do is focus on the social networks. Um, a lot of the panelists and colleagues have already kind of touched on some of the issues that uh, um, have been raised like the include including social networks including caregivers and i'm going to home in on that some 
And nowhere is that more evident than what we're experiencing now with the COVID-19 response. Our interdependence with one another is acutely visible, whether it's communities coming together to help one another, um, the challenges of isolation, especially among the elderly as people are unable to visit them, as well as the uh, challenges of being in the hospital without being able to receive visitors um, as we are used to. So um, with that, I would, uh, I'm going to focus on some social, natural social connections that uh, are needed to be involved in artificial intelligence applications. Uh, next slide. So this is the outline of what I'm going to cover. I'm going to focus on just highlight some of the need, uh, the promise of AI as we have it. The, uh, I'm going to highlight two gaps that I think is, are worth no, uh, noting and then a few recommendations. Next slide. So a lot of people have already touched on this, but just to put uh, some numbers on who we're talking about, uh, WHO estimates that about 15% of the people around the world are differently abled. And while uh, disability dependence can strike people at any age and any stage of life, the largest predictor of disability is age. Um, and within the US, the cognitive disability being a big focus of disability, 16 million individuals are living with some type of cognitive dis disability and, about big, and that population is growing as, we're, um, as people are aging uh, with dementia and other conditions. These conditions, uh, the need for these populations are going to continue to grow. And there's two demographic factors that I think are worth mentioning to think about the scope of the problem in years to come. The first is between now and 2050, which is 30 years from now, the percentage of the world's population that will be 60 and over will uh, approximately double from about 605 million people to about 2 billion individuals across the world. Another compounding factor is that the size of family is declining. So family members are often the de facto caregivers of people who are differently able and dependent. And in 2010, which is about 10 years ago, it was estimated that there was roughly seven informal caregivers available for people who are 80 years or above. And these are family members and friends. And in about 30 years, um, this ratio will drop to three to one. So you can see that even as people, are, the needs of the population are increasing, the number of people who can provide care within informal structures is dropping. Next slide. And the AI tools have been transforming care in, in an incredible uh, way. And I'm not going to read out each of these things, but a lot of you already are familiar with a lot of the products out there. And because of the nature of my talk, I'm gonna focus on largely consumer focused uh, products. So for example, people, we have developed wearables like Apple Watch um, or smart clothing, such as bras that can uh, detect breast cancer risk. Um, we, are, we have developed tools to manage physical and mental health conditions. Uh, we're using voice-activated digital assistants such as Amazon Echo and LEQ for coordinating care and medications, medication adherence. Uh, we are not, uh, we've also focused on companionship. How do we improve uh, companionship and alleviate the epidemic of loneliness that we're seeing? And then because of the aging population, it's not surprising that there's a fair bit of attention on passive or biometric remote monitoring to monitor falls. So there's a lot of work that's being done in this space that is directly focused on individual needs and um, providing care directly to the people. Next slide. But there are gaps in here. For example, the first gap that I wanna talk about is the limited attention to social process. So we know from decades of research that social support uh, in any chronic condition, cardiovascular disease, cancer, lung disease, improves longevity, improves health outcomes, and the presence of having social support actually mitigates adverse outcomes once you develop a condition. And this has been shown over and over again, and it shouldn't be a big surprise that we, we have that because we are inherently social creatures. 
usually we talk about two types of social support. Emotional support is kind of what it sounds like. Um, you calling, I'm sure a lot of you already are calling and checking in on your friends and family members. Your family members are checking and friends are checking on you. That type of work is emotional support. Instrumental are some of the more practical things, running errands, for example, getting groceries, managing uh, medications, that type of thing. And despite our understanding of social support uh, over the decades, the current status of AI, consumer focus at AI, is still focused on individual change. So if you think about, for example, wearables like an Apple Watch, it really is giving you feedback to what your progress has been and what, you know, and so it's for you to determine whether you want to increase your activity or decrease your heart rate or what have you. Whenever there is an engagement of um, social process, it's over, overly simplified. So the big ones that uh, we all know is gamification, so kind of competing with one another for a common goal, doing a seven day exercise challenge or uh, a Strava race, or virality. And virality are the likes and the high fives and all those things. These are really, while these are of course, uh, so, or face valid ways of encouraging people, these are extremely simplistic ways of engaging other individuals in a common goal. And a lot of social theories are out there and generally we find that the, there's an absence of principles from social theories that are applied to AI tools. Next slide. The second gap I want to uh, focus on, and this is something uh, even the first panelist Noel, uh, also referred to, which is we don't really engage informal caregivers. Again, these are family members and friends who provide health-related support. Um, could you click again? Because it's animated. Thank you. Um, in the U.S. alone, it's estimated that 50 million adults provide $470 billion worth of unpaid services. Click, please. Um, that's a big number, and just to compare it with some of the common uh, big uh, fortune companies of Facebook, which is a social media company, it actually makes money off of social connection, is valued at less than $400 billion. And national surveys show that informal caregivers provide care, informal care on an average about 18 hours per week, which is almost a half-time job, and 60% of caregivers are also holding down another position at the same time. And yet, when we are talking about all these tools, we are not really engaging the informal caregiver's needs in, uh, in building the tools or understanding what is it that their, their needs are. The one exception is with the remote monitoring devices or the systems, these are often built so that a caregiver uh, is receiving information about their loved one, but that's also because a caregiver is in fact the eventual customer of that product or the consumer of that product. And so they're the ones who might be interested in purchasing the system to install in their loved one's homes. And so there's a lot of other ways that we could be engaging caregivers that we are not because of our focus on the individual. Next slide. So here are some of the recommendations that um, um, I have for people who might be building these consumer focused tools. First is we need to harness the power of social processes. Key amongst them is the idea of motivation. So not everybody is motivated in the same way. I'm sure you can uh, think about yourself and some other people you know. Some of us are motivated more for intrinsic reasons, meaning something inside of us. And some of us are motivated more by extrinsic rewards and that type of thing. Most of us are motivated for, uh, on a spectrum based on what the activity is. The other concept uh, that is really important is the idea of social contagion. So this idea, which is put forth by Nicholas Christakis at Yale, is the idea that behaviors tend to spread within a social, uh, within a social network, just the, in the same way that an infection can spread and nowhere, no, there's no other better time to talk about that as right now. And this involves both that be dysfunctional behaviors, so it could be um, smoking behaviors or unfortunately suicide clusters, but also positive behaviors can spread too. So when you when people have a loved one who is, for example, trying to quit smoking and they see that being successful, they may become inspired to also 
uh, do the same. Or weight loss is a big uh, place where you see people kind of doing this in groups. So the idea is that there's social processes involved in behavior change that can be harnessed when we're thinking of AI tools. The other gap and the other recommendation is that we need to do a better job of relying on behavioral and social theory. There's a lot of behavioral change theory and behavior maintenance theories out there. And there's uh, theories that are looking at dyadic health behavior, including our own. Uh, and the, one of the biggest criticisms of the current just broader tech tool world is that we are making ad hoc tools without really engaging behavioral scientists or social scientists in their creation. And that might be a big reason why people typically download an app or enroll in a pro program, but do not then continue to engage with it. Um, so these models both are important for building the tool as well as continuing to get people engaged within the tools. And then finally, this is something that uh, has been kind of somewhat of a thread throughout, especially in the keynote spe uh, speaker's presentation, which is that we really need to focus on cultural considerations, um, whether it is racial ethnic uh, differences or people who have LGBTQ plus Id identities or any other cultural group that you can think of, if your end product is going to be uh, of use to them, then that person or that representatives of that community absolutely need to be involved in the development of the product um, at every stage along the way, as well as during the pilot phases. Um, and this could be engaging diverse teams and stakeholders at all stages of development. And if it's caregiver focused and engaging caregivers from different cultural backgrounds. And this is always important, but it's magnified in its importance when you're thinking of social, the social networks, because so much of social change is, um, is uh, culturally embedded. Um, next slide. The, the next two slides, I'm not gonna talk about this, is I included it so that when you have your, when you get the PDFs, they're included, so you can skip past this one and the next one, Carmel. But these are just the two models that I mentioned. So in summary, uh, all individuals, but especially those who are differently abled and dependent, rely on social connections. And AI is poised to harness the power of these connections in its applications, as, and we need to do that with sensitivity to cultural differences. Next slide. And I won't read this out just in the interest of time because I know we're past the time. So I will go to the next slide, which is uh, thank you so much. And you can email me or tweet at me um, and I will hand it over to Sona. Thank you, Ranak. And a huge thank you to all three of our panelists. I think we have time for one quick question before we wrap up for the afternoon. Um, as many of you know, I spent uh, 25 years in uh, high tech before I came to Stanford about a dozen years ago. So many of the questions I see being discussed here in Silicon Valley and in this hub of innovation is how do we balance innovation and equity? And especially now in this COVID-19 situation, we're pushing, pushing for innovation without much of any focus on equitable inclusiveness as focused on by all our panelists, uh, personal privacy, consent, uh, surveillance. And so your views on how do we manage this world of balancing innovation and yet not having haste make waste and where the larger burden of that waste will fall on people with who lack privilege, including privileges of ability and, 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 and dependencies. Ranak, you wanna go first? Sure, yeah, I think, well, when you say balance, innovation to equity, it, those are not opposite sides of the spectrum. And I think there's this, um, we sometimes feel that we can kind of create a product or create an intervention um, for kind of a narrow focus and then we'll be able to broaden it at a later time. But turns out that's, first of all, not the most efficient way of going about it. So to the extent that we want to be fast, we cannot cr uh, create products that are not effective and meet the needs of broader people. 
I think the uh, key thing is to first recognize who are some of the people who will be using the product. So for instance, one of the things that people have found with the wearable physical activity trackers like Fitbits and Apple Watch and what have you is actually it's the fitter people who wear them continually um, or people who log um, their diet in MyFitnessPal, which is not an AI based tool necessarily is the people who are actually adhering to a diet. So even within that, we are not doing a good job of capturing people who are actually poised to make the changes. Um, having that, our community outreach, Noel talked about that early on today, of having that community outreach, having a diverse uh, staff that, would, that is involved in this, um, having representation of, at every stage of the development and having representation as a, with an advisory board are all, I think, critical ways in which we can balance that. Thank you. So what I'm hearing you say is that we're further exacerbating inequity with this idea that we define progress as innovation for a few versus innovation for all. That's a great way of summarizing, yes. Thank you. Uh, Sharona, your views. Yeah, so uh, from the law, perspe law professor perspective, I would um, add that we just have to make sure that the law catches up to technology and that we have appropriate legal protections. So I really do think that we need to revisit the HIPAA privacy rule, make sure that it covers all the entities that are dealing with health information so that we don't get disclosures so that we get the um, protections of the data that are available through the HIPAA security rule right now. If you're not under the HIPAA privacy rule, you don't even have to put the careful security measures in place. And so all the data is vulnerable to privacy breaches. And we also have to revisit the anti-discrimination laws to make sure that employers, insurers, and others cannot discriminate based on any health information they get that is not currently covered by the laws, such as predictive health information, which we've been talking about. So um, my contribution is just to make sure that we have the legal protections um, that are now necessitated by all of this new technology and by AI activities. Thank you, Sharona. It's, it's heartening to hear you say that. It's also heartening to connect your last comment to that of our colleague from Microsoft, where they do, as a company and as the presenter shared, are focusing in seeking greater policy and legislative boundaries versus each organization or individual coming up with their own. Thank you. Ari. So I think there are two things. Um, one is there's an emerging conversation on the uh, importance of granular privacy controls and electronic health records. Uh, people should have, and I believe this has come up in the context of the HIPAA rule, um, uh, more than just the decision as to uh, uh, whether or not to share their records or not, but the ability to hold certain parts of their records as private. Um, even within a health system. I think we need to incorporate into that the idea that uh, one can hold certain parts of one's records private, not only from providers, but also from an algorithm. Um, if there may be certain aspects of one's medical record that one is concerned may be misinterpreted by, or even accurately interpreted by a predictive algorithm, people do and should have a right to decide what aspects of their private health information, uh, personal health information are uh, made available and, and incorporated into the model. Um, beyond that, I would just briefly say, you know, I don't think there's any substitute for um, building a larger cohort of people with disabilities with the requisite technical expertise to participate in um, uh, model and algorithmic algorithm development. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, our community is really only going to be represented if we are at the table, not only from a legal standpoint and a policy standpoint, but a technical standpoint as well. Great, thank you, Ari. Really appreciate that. Um, so I'll wrap up with one of my favorite quotes from Yuval Noah Harari in his latest book, Twenty One Lessons for the Twenty First Century, where he says. Humans were always far better at inventing tools than using them wisely. And I wish that the work and effort we've done here today and will continue to do 
will contribute to that wisdom. Thank you all. Turning it over to Carmel. Thank you, Sunu. I want to thank everybody who came to this live stream. As Glenn mentioned at the start of the event, this is our first live stream event, but will not be the last one. In fact, we have an event coming up on Friday on medical debt in Africa and the US. If you are interested in any of our events, the best way to get a hold of the live stream link is to go to the event website and register, just as you did for this event. We will also be posting the PowerPoints for the presenters within the next day. And then as soon as we have the captioning on the video, we will be posting the video on the event page so that you can share it with people who were not able to attend. So thank you for joining and we hope that you all stay well.